I'm at my friend Tim Pool's house. Oh, it's very, very fine. I'm at my friend Tim Pool's house, so oh, it's very, very fine. I'm here to sell my book. It's speechless control and words control and minds. So, thank you, thank so you. this guy, Michael Knowles, shows up to my house, <laughs> and he notices there's a guitar in the corner, and he was like, what's all that about? I was like, hey, t t go, go play it. And then uh, just a, like literally 30 seconds before about to go live, he yeah. writes that, and I was like, wait, 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 let's open with that. Have you play that song? Uh, so there's news today. Big news outside of Speechless by uh, Michael Knowles. Your book. John McAfee, man. Poor guy. Epstein. He, you think so? Yeah, there's no... Uh, I think the conspiracy theory is that John McAfee killed himself in prison, right? That's the, <laughs> yeah. That is the least plausible well, explanation. Well, we'll, we'll definitely, I want to I save it because this is going to be big, so we'll just do quick intros. But the long story short is McAfee has repeatedly said he would never take his own life. Mm. They're now reporting he apparently did. He was about to be extradited back to the U.S. where he said they were going to get him. They were claiming he had crypto hidden and owed tax dollars he wasn't paying. And now this, now they're saying they found him dead and it's apparent suicide. But we're going to go through the tweets, the things he's posted, and the actual conspiracy theory. Um, plus some other news. We got, uh, uh, what is it, General Mark Milley saying that white rage caused January mm. 6th. Yikes. And Joe Biden is going after guns again. Yep. He's going to be diverting, what is it, $350 billion from COVID funding into going after guns or something like that? I mean, this is, this is, this is nuts. But we'll, we'll, I want to make sure I get the facts right. So, so we'll, we'll, we'll get to those stories. But uh, as you may have already noticed, Michael Knowles is hanging out. He, he actually opened the show with a song. <laughs> How's it going, man? It's going great. I am so exhausted because this is book week. So the book, Speechless came out yesterday, and they just send you on this tour, and you just, you're talking, I've been shilling this thing for six months, Dude. but now this is the week to do it. So I'm really glad we could get a little music going, right kind of loosen up a little. Yeah. Plus, I think we've already done enough shilling for your book, personally, on this show. <laughs> you, of, I haven't yet, though. If I hit to. the bestseller list, it is because of you. It <laughs> yeah, is this right. show that that's did right. it. That's right. Because everybody was super chatting something like, this latest news story has left me speechless. <laughs> Just like Speechless by Michael Knowles. <laughs> like, yep, yep. It was, a, it was one of the smartest marketing cam campaigns, mind you. I, you know, it's, it was a brilliant marketing campaign that I never thought of. <laughs> I, <guess. laughs> I guess uh, you guys put together like a montage of me getting caught by the super chats and being like, oh, they got me. You know, like. <laughs> But uh, so, yeah, yeah, we'll definitely we'll talk about all that as well. Um, we got Ian. Schiller. Hey, everybody. Ian Cross. What's up, Michael? I'm so glad your book's out now, dude. Uh, I want to hear all about it tonight. I'm excited. I'm done. I'm done with it. Oh, I've yeah. never arrived. I've said never everything again. I have to you're, say. You're, you're on the path. I'm done. Yeah. yeah. Retirement looks good. Huh? It does. Relax. <laughs> yeah. You know. I am loving Tim Cast's musical. I would like to make mm. this a normal thing. Uh, Michael's uh, skill is very much appreciated. I'm excited for tonight. Yeah, I was impressed. I that was, that was, that was a head. good song. You Thank you. Top of your top of your head. Right on. You know, th these days, I, I'm really branching out. Mm -hmm. You know, I think this is what Nancy Pelosi <laughs> sold Obamacare. She said, you can just explore your arts. You can be a poet. You can be a musician. So that's, that's what I'm doing. Boom. Now. There you go. Perfect. Yeah. All right. Well, we got we to get to these stories. But before we do, ladies and gentlemen, we have an amazing sponsor. It's Virtual Shield, the virtual private network service for you. Go to surfinginternetsafe.com. The link is in the description below. And you can get 30% off for life. They say $3.49 per month. Now, a virtual private network service. What this does is very, very easy. You download a program, you click go, and you can actually set it so that you appear to be in like any other country. What this does is makes it harder for hackers, for governments, for spies, for nasty, nosy individuals to spy upon your data. It makes it harder for big tech. It is a basic level of security. It's like closing your blinds, locking your window, you know? I, I always explain it like this. You may have heard it a million times, but I'm eternally grateful to uh, Virtual Shield for sponsoring the show for so long. We don't always expect people to break into our houses, but we still lock our doors. We still lock our windows. That's why it really does make sense to have some basic level of security, especially if, you know, you may be connecting to certain networks that are not your home or something. You always want to have some basic protection. Virtual Shield offers you this. And they actually say that right now you can get 24 months of the online security from the world's easiest and fastest VPN for only $83.83. That's actually 68% off. Plus, you'll get 30% off all add-ons and other great discounts from their other plans. They're proud to announce that this month, all discounts are guaranteed for life. That means 30% off for as long as you are a customer. Go to Surfing Internet Safe. The link is in the description below. And I'm going to shout them out. Just look, Virtual Shield, my first sponsor ever. 
on any YouTube thing I ever did. They have been there from the beginning. And I'm eternally grateful to any one of these companies that wants to sponsor shows like this because it shows they really care and they're willing to do what so many others aren't. I'm eternally grateful for that. Thank you, Virtual Shield. But don't forget, you can also go to TimCast.com, become a member. We're going to have a bonus segment coming up at around 11 or so. And of course, many of you may, be, may, may now know that Cassandra Fairbanks is officially coming on as the editor-in-chief. She's writing articles for us. They're amazing. Her work is, 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 is absolutely brilliant. We've got a handful of other journalists who are set to join very soon. The new website is launching very soon. We just hired our paranormal and unexplained writer who's going to be working on a series of articles that... It's like news stories that we never quite understand. These are real. These are not, you know, creepy. It's not meant to be like supernatural in the sense that we believe in magic, but it's more so these are crazy stories that have never been explained that we want to explore. Plus, we're going to do a lot more. We got the vlog, as you know, and uh, I will just shout out now. We're actually uh, hiring a few roles. We're looking for a video uh, uh, filmer and editor, as well as a building manager and a receptionist. So jobs at TimCast.com. Become a member. Let's jump into this first story, the one that uh, no one believes but is being reported anyway. (laughs) Wall Street Journal says, John McAfee, antivirus software creator, is found dead in Spanish jail. Notice the headline they used. Many other networks are saying from apparent suicide or was found dead due to suicide. Not the Wall Street Journal. They say he's just found dead. Spanish court had ordered his extradition to the U.S. where he faced tax-related criminal charges. They say, the Manhattan U.S. Attorney's Office also sought the extradition of Mr. Uh, Mr. Mac- McAfee in a separate criminal case. John was and will always be remembered as a fighter, said Nishé K. Sanan, an attorney representing Mr. McAfee, in U.S. criminal proceedings. He tried to love this country, but the U.S. government made his existence impossible. Now, I'm going to jump over to this article from Cassandra Fairbanks over at TimCast.com because she actually breaks down what makes this story so interesting. In Cassandra's article, she, she notes several tweets from McAfee himself. He tweeted once, Getting subtle messages from U.S. officials saying, in effect, we're coming for you, McAfee. We're going to kill yourself. I got a tattoo today just in case. If I suicide myself, I didn't. I was whacked. Check my right arm. And he has a tattoo on his right arm that says it's a dollar sign and whacked. There's a, uh, she also mentions a year before that tweet, he claimed, if I hang myself a la Epstein, it will be no fault of mine. The eccentric, eccentric figure was arrested by Spanish authorities on October 3rd, 2020, at the El Prat Airport at the behest of the U.S. government. He was wanted for evading paying millions of dollars in taxes. He was facing up to 30 years in prison. Here's another tweet from John McAfee who said, Powerful people who commit crimes have only one enemy, those who reveal crimes. And it's a photo of Julian Assange. And there's another photo, for, uh, another tweet from McAfee where he said, I have nothing, yet I regret nothing. The U.S. believes I've hidden crypto. I wish I did. But it has dissolved through the many hands of Team McAfee. He says, uh, and my remaining assets have all been seized. My friends evaporated through fear of association. So this is what makes the story so interesting. Which which is the more plausible conspiracy? Because no matter what you choose to believe, it's a conspiracy. Right. (laughs) Did McAfee kill himself? Well, that's a conspiracy. Someone killed him, right? Who did it? Why? Yeah. They're saying it was a suicide. Or did he, uh, or, or I should say, if he did kill himself, that means everything he tweeted was an elaborate plot to manipulate people in the event he actually did. Or whatever, maybe he changed his mind. And if he didn't actually do it, then who actually killed the guy? So I, I, I'm just going to say this. People are saying he got epstein That's the verb they're using, which makes the assumption that uh, what people think about Epstein, you know, we all know that story. In this, in this instance, I'm just going to say it. McAfee repeatedly said he would never kill himself. That means you would have to believe he set up an elaborate plot to manipulate everybody in the event he actually did. Because not only are they saying it is suicide when he said he wouldn't do it, but after he died, we get this. Mike Rothschild says, John McAfee's final Instagram post, a giant Q. The post went up around 1.15 Pacific time, meaning he was likely already dead. But he or someone else on his team knew exactly what to do to achieve maximum-ish posting effect. Okay. So what is it? What's going on? You know what this tells you? This tells you, forget about McAfee for a second. It's very sad that he died. Forget about whatever happened in Spain or whatever the crimes are. This tells you what people think about their own government right now. The fact that we use Epstein as a verb tells you what people think (laughs) about their own government. If this were an earlier era, say we're 100 years ago, some guy is found dead of suicide. 
The idea that the federal government would have killed him would be very outlandish to Americans. I, I, I actually don't think they would have had such distrust in their government that they would know. have said that. I don't know. You think they always would have? You know, one of, one of the issues I often deal with is like a youth bias, right? Mm. <clears throat> so I grew up kind of, you know, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, believing in America. I, I, I had a, a, a family that still taught me about, you know, like, n- not just the— well, let's call it the colonial perspective, not a woke family by any means, but a, you know, very um, analytical one. And uh, I believed in this country. And then I think back to like when I see all these political conflicts, I'm like, this is the worst it's ever been. And yeah. then I'm like, but I've heard about the weather underground. Yeah. So I wonder if it really is the worst it's ever been or just the worst I've ever seen. Yeah. In which case you think about, you know, certain civil rights figures who were killed. Yeah, yeah. Martin Luther King. I mean, there's a conspiracy. He actually, a civil suit was settled with his family. I think it was in 2001. Um, that the FBI? Yeah, someone was responsible I think it was like the FBI or CIA, but somebody was like involved with his death and his family got paid out by the government. I don't know a whole lot about it, so I, I, I don't want to wade too much into conspiratorial territory, but wasn't there like a letter sent to him by some fed telling him to kill himself or something like that? I don't know. Well, there, you know, it's certainly the case that the federal government was keeping tabs on him as they were on many other radical figures. And, and in, in most of these cases, by the way, the simplest explanation is usually the the one that I'll go with. So in the killing of Kennedy, there are a million theories on how Kennedy was killed. Uh, The communists wanted to kill him. A communist said that he killed him. And then we were told that a communist killed him and he was an anti-communist. So I I kind (laughs) of go with it. You know, I kind of believe it. Uh, In this case, though, we have seen every single American such corruption from the federal agencies in just the last five years the the federal agencies being turned on a political opponent during the 2016 race to to try to subvert that election. Then they continued to go after Trump after he was in office. Then the complete dishonesty that we've gotten from the federal government and the international community during COVID, during the lockdowns, changing the story every day, that this is a real political problem. When we just, when we assume that the federal government is just popping people off in prison and, and we just shrug our shoulders. What's going to happen with the McAfee story? Nothing. Not, what right. happened with the Epstein story? <clears throat> Nothing. We laughed about it. We turned it into a meme. That, to me, that is more distressing, actually, than any of these discrete incidents. We're in that dystopia. Yeah. We, and, and nothing's being done to, to get justice. The system is completely broken. There's that story right now of this, uh, this grandma who got a misdemeanor charge for the insurrection. Which really does send a, you know, a sledgehammer right to the narrative. Oh, some little old lady got a misdemeanor slap on the wrist for what you call an insurrection. Mm. Come on. You they know. couldn't even get these people. But, but you look at still the lopsided prosecution of this. Where at, in New York, it was just reported by the New York Post, hundreds of charges related to looting and rioting were dropped. The majority of charges in the Bronx and in Manhattan, the majority of them completely dismissed. And then the other ones, by the way, where people are looting, where people are robbing pled down to trespassing, which carries no jail time. It's very, very simple charge. January 6th, though, is an insurrection. These well, people it, got you know, rot, rot in solitary. If you put on the horn helmet and you go dance on Nancy Pelosi's lectern, that is a crime against humanity for which you, you need to go to Gitmo. It, obviously, the, the double standard is preposterous. You think of this little old granny from the, the Capitol riot. If she had just thrown a Molotov cocktail at a courthouse <laughs> in Minneapolis, she'd, she'd get off scot-free. But there's, wow. there's obviously a massive double standard here. To be fair, though— the ones they go after are actually the ones who target the government building. So like in the instance of Portland, most of the ones, most of these rioters and looters who smash up small businesses yeah. and punch cops, eh, no problem there. <laughs> but, but the ones who actually set fire to the police building, yeah, they're getting charged. Because that's, that, that's, that's, that's the way it works. You go after the government, they throw the book at you. But the way, you have to private citizens, they don't care. <laughs> what is that phrase we keep hearing with January 6th, the coup, insurrection. the insurrection, you know? The phrase we, we uh, keep hearing is that this is a threat to our democracy. Mm-hmm. Our, and I'm reminded of this point by Angelo Codevilla. He's a scholar at the Claremont Institute who points out that the people who talk about our democracy tend to be referring to their oligarchy. <laughs> they, don't seem, <laughs> they don't seem to be very democratic at all. I know right, right, John right. McCain was started calling people friends 
Uh, yeah, friend in 2008. I think he was running for president of the eight, 2008. Yeah, um, some and he just kept saying too. friend. And it was like, I'm not your friend. Yeah, dude. <laughs> no one really is. Yeah. So cut it out. Yeah, yeah that, that, I, I loved it. So uh, I was one of those people that said, you know, sad to see John McCain pass when he did. Yep. But like literally every political uh, spe- like quadrant of the political spectrum, there was a meme where it was like centrists were like, you know, I can pay respects in death. And the authoritarian left, libertarian left, Libertarian right, authoritarian right, we're all like he was awful and evil and good <laughs> yeah. riddance. And, yeah. But but anyway, going back to the to the, the McAfee thing, I'm talking about this this conspiracy, mm-hmm. this post that goes up on his Instagram, the big Q. Yeah. What the heck? What was John McAfee wanted for? He wasn't some political figure. Yeah. It was tax evasion. So I have to. I, I I'll say this. I can understand the idea that some people might say, look, the guy was a troll. And so he knew that doing everything he did would create this conspiracy in his death, and that's what he was going for. Mm-hmm. John McAfee, so, so I, I stop and I say, yeah, 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 he was a troll. He loved it. He loved every minute of it. Even being in prison, he was still posting. Yeah. I don't think the guy would want to end that. He's, he, he was old, sure, but the dude loved doing these, these, these things with the media, with Twitter, with social media. I just don't, I don't, I don't see it. Um, yeah, I don't know. Though. The fact that we can't name what the crime was is is kind of weird, isn't it? I mean, don't you when when someone tax is evasion? with tax? Yeah. I guess it's tax evasion. There was some issue in Latin America where someone was killed. You remember? And there was this claim. I, I don't know. This was years oh, ago. Yeah. At this point, I mean, he's had this. I worked for Vice. I know all about. That's it. right. You you have a sort of association <laughs> to this story. It, he obviously the guy lived a colorful life to say mm-hmm. the very least. But the fact that this guy was being held in a Spanish prison, the U.S. is trying to extradite him. He's a very well-known figure, but but all the details are kind of murky. And then he winds up dead after saying he would never kill himself. <laughs> That's like out of a out of a thriller movie. The challenge is this dude's life was so fantastical yeah. that you have to wonder how much of it was him being a storyteller. Right. So is this a guy who was old? No money left in prison, and so he was like, "My last hurrah is going to be the best troll ever pulled oh, off." By rather anyone. than get stuck in prison and just mm-hmm. rot away. Yeah, he's an old, old guy, and he was like, "I am going to pull off the greatest troll in the history of mankind." He's it, he's on the verge. It could of it. be, the, but the the thing is, people who are actually brought to to do that to take their own life. This is not some flippant thing, you know. It's not just just a joke on Twitter. I mean, this is yeah. you're, you're coming face to face with your mortality. The people who tend to do that don't, in my experience and having read about these things, they don't seem to be exuberant at the last moment. You know, they, I right, don't right, know. Right. This would, that would be quite a show to put on as that's, you're that's, doing this. Awful that's why thing. ultimately I don't believe it. Yeah. The, the, the dude was such a, a um, bombastic character who enjoyed every minute of it. I just don't see him being like, this is the end of the line for me. You get weird yeah. stories. Some people will like clean their whole house before they kill themselves. And you're like, what the heck? Because they didn't want to leave a mess. Like, yeah. it's just really weird psychology going on. I don't know if he was just beaten down in prison, if he was being tortured, if he if he was under threat of like torture and like going to give up some people that he actually did give his money to that now he's just kind of lied and killed himself to protect them. Well, I, one of the things he said in one of his tweets earlier was that all the Bitcoin that he had amassed had kind of disappeared to, I think, Tim McAfee which is kind of interesting to me. Hmm. So he's already saying that he doesn't have any money. So I don't know if you're going to die. And if you are an ish poster in life, yeah. then you might want to be one in death as well. I don't know what he was doing. You know, like he, he, he would tweet a lot about how he had, he was going to name names and he had evidence and stuff. Right. Now here's, here's what, here's the fun part. Apparently he posted that, you know, someone asked him, I hope you set up dead man switches that in the event you, you are, you know, taken out or something, yeah. they'll get released. And he says, I have, and they will. And I'll name names and it'll all come out. That's why the, the queue that was posted on Instagram has a lot of people going like, oh, oh, is this it? Is it going to happen? Yeah, get ready. Somebody who knew him posted it. I'm not, I'm not convinced. I'm sure it was. Many millenarian cults around the world have said on this date, this is when it will all change. <laughs> yeah. This is the fine. Everything is going to be different. And it, it just never is. And, and whether it's with the election, whether it's with some corruption in the federal government, they, it, oh, I'm, I keep waiting for the date and it never comes around. Epstein is trending nationwide yeah. <laughs> on, on Twitter. Oh, wow. That's, that, that's the part that really creeps me out the most. Yeah. That, we, you know, what, what, what are the guards in that story? They lied, right? That's, what the, that's, that's the news that yeah. came out. Yeah. They lied 
Something weird went down. People died. He fell off his top bunk <laughs> with a sheet tied around his yeah. neck. Is that the story? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know, man. Yeah, and these but, very uh, sort of dainty, Clinton-esque fingerprints yeah, on his strange. throat. <laughs> I don't know. It's weird. I think so he said weird. the week it's before weird. he died that he, someone was trying to poison him, and he looked Well, his, 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 his cellmate attacked him. Yeah. yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Jeez. And that's I why people are calling it getting Epstein. Mm. Yeah. I do, I do like the way he phrased it, though, when he said... The, the feds were saying, I will kill yourself. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. one way to put <laughs> it, dude. he's doing. Yeah, but the, the really sad thing about this for me, obviously you feel bad for his family and his friends. What are we going to do about it? I mean, for even forget the McAfee thing for a second. I guess I don't really feel bad for Epstein's friends. I, uh, that's one. <laughs> the, the li- limits of sympathy yeah. are, are only so much. Yeah, bad. yeah, yeah. What are we going to do about it? If we are all say, I, I think probably the vast majority of Americans believe that Jeffrey Epstein was offed or someone was permitted to off him, or there was some corruption involved, and yet, uh, and uh, right. that's the way the government works. Yep. Wow. I, 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 I gotta say, I love it. The, the, the best tweet out of the entire, when the story broke, was uh, it was Chris Reagan, who said he got into an Uber, and the driver immediately turns and goes, yo, that guy didn't kill himself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, this random Uber driver said that, and look, I, I honestly don't know. It, it, is, it is possible. I think we, we, gotta, we gotta check our movie biases. Yeah. Right. Like, here's the example I always use. People think silencers go pew, pew, pew. Yeah, like, yeah. they don't. They go whap, whap really yeah. loud. Yeah. Um, they're amazing, by the way. They do, you know, you're outside and you're like, the first time I ever fired with a suppressor, I was like, wow. Yeah. Not like a movie, though. Yeah. Still ridiculously loud, and you can follow the sound to go find your friends when they're at the range or whatever. But be- because of the movies, people genuinely believe these things. Yeah. So when you see a story like Epstein, like, there really is a simple solution that the dude was at the end of his rope. Like, and, and the same is true for McAfee. The As same is true were, for yeah. Epstein. Very literally like, at the end mm-hmm. of his rope. Yes. I mean, yeah. the, <laughs> look, if you, it, you can even think about it. Now, first of all, I certainly think there's a lot of malfeasance, and corruption, something weird happened with Epstein. But it's not out of the realm of possibility. It's actually very likely. I wouldn't say I would weight it as pro- the most probable. Yeah. But here you got a guy who was living large, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars from who knows where, doing whatever he wanted to do. Some people think it was blackmail. Yeah. They got him. Imagine if this guy's whole MO was that he was filming these elites in compromising positions and then blackmailing them. Yeah. And they were scared that if they went against them, they, he'd release footage of them. That's like one of the conspiracy theories. Now imagine he ends up in prison having lost and he knows he's done. And you've got a lot of people, wealthy individuals who are sweating bullets. It may have just been that the elites he was blackmailing should he have been if he was i'm not saying he was he just lost or at the very at the very least he went from very very here's what i said at the time i'm like here's a guy who's got his own private island Mm. he was living the biggest life a human could hope to live and now he's in a prison cell it's possible i mean here's a person who just like finally says okay and with mcafee the same thing same things uh same thing here's a guy who's really old He's had his adventure. He's had his journey. He's not going to lock him away for 30 years. How old years. was he? I actually didn't 70, think he was born 70, in 45. Yeah, so. Oh, okay. Yeah, that, he's, older. he's older than yeah, I thought he was. He was older. Yeah. 75. He still, I mean, he's, yeah. that's not 95, you know. But, right. But still, that's but it's up there. And maybe, But maybe he was like 30 years in prison. I'm a goth bang. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's what I you think. Know, I don't know. I think he just, I think he took, him, took his own life. It's tough to say. The thing is, the government doesn't like copycat criminals, which is part of why they're cracking down so hard on people that are violating federal buildings and federal property. And the reason why they go after people for tax evasion, because if McAfee gets away with millions of dollars of tax evasion, gets away with That's it, right. a lot of people... I suppose people- this is my problem with it, though. I, of course, people at the end of their rope can off themselves, and that's happened plenty of times. He's a pretty high-value individual. He's a pretty high-profile prisoner. Jeffrey Epstein was the most high-profile yep. prisoner in the whole system. How do you just get allowed to kill yourself? Is, right. Aren't there cameras? I don't know. I have like a, you know, I have like a ring doorbell. Oh, the camera like, malfunction. Right? Oh, it mal- I forgot. Yeah, it mal- right. And the two guards malfunction. Yeah. And, and, <laughs> yeah. and lied about right. it. And, right. right. Or slay the kid. <laughs> yeah. So I mean. when we used to put people on suicide watch at the hospital, you would take everything from their room. You couldn't have a call light with a cord. You couldn't have metal utensils to eat with. You got a paper tray. Your food was on like a styrofoam thing. You had nothing. You didn't have a phone with a cable. You didn't have blinds with a cord. Yeah. You didn't have bed sheets. You literally didn't have bed sheets. So it shocks me on every level that they allowed this to happen, especially since Epstein had tried to commit suicide. This is why he was by himself. Let's uh, let's do a, a bit of a hard segue here because, oh, you know, we're, 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 I'm just thinking about the corruption of the elites, yeah. the ideology that permeates through them, and there's only, there's only so much we can say necessarily about what are speculating on, you know, McAfee or Epstein. 
But we have this other story that I want to jump into. Joint Chiefs Chairman Mark Milley defends teaching critical race theory in the military slams offensive claims that troops are turning woke and links white rage to the Capitol riot. Now, I know it's not the perfect segue off of, you know, what we were just talking about, but there is this core element of what's happening to our political elites, our establishment, our industry elites, the ideology they've embraced. And this story actually freaked me out to see Joint Chief Chairman, he's a general, Mark Milley, Mm -hmm. saying that he's reading Mao Zedong and Lenin, (laughs) but that doesn't make him a communist. And that white rage was what caused January 6th, essentially. It's offensive to say, what do they say? Uh, the general appeared to link white rage to the Capitol right on January 6th. Now, that's one of the, the, the most the freakiest things I've seen. I mean, this is a non-theistic religion. I guess you'd call it a cult. Yeah. Can't at you, the highest levels of government. Can't you just imagine the gunnery sergeant? Did you just make a transphobic comment, soldier? <laughs> that is not my pronoun. <laughs> yeah. How dare you microaggress? Uh, sir, I, I thought I was supposed to macroaggress. Uh, yeah, right. Right. I have a gun for that reason, <laughs> but apparently... So I have to wonder about, um, these are people who believe there is no truth but power. They have routinely said there is no objective reality. And the idea that there is no truth but power is, I would say to a certain degree, there's an element of truth to it, but it is a very, very fascistic ideology that is being employed by the left. When I say there's a certain element of truth, basically that means, sure, if a bunch of leftists have weapons and are beating you and then demand you say there are five lights. Yeah. You can force someone to say there are five lights. But but there won't actually be. Yeah. Exactly. But the history books will tell you that there were. Right. And that's what that's what the left has realized that they can beat people in a submission to just say falsehoods under the under the and assert it's true. And then they're hoping that in ten years these stories will become history. Right. Well, so, it's, it's, the, the left tells us they're doing this with the 1619 Project. They, they say outright, this woman, Nicole Hannah-Jones, lied about her central thesis, but she said, yeah, whatever. I, I don't care about the facts. I'm reframing American history to put slavery at the center of it, and it's, it's very effective to do that. And that's what they're doing now in the Navy. This was, the military was basically the last institution that the conservatives still had some control over. All of the other ones the media, the schools, the, the administrative government, all of that had fallen a long time ago. And now in the military, you're seeing that, that total infiltration. The, the chief of naval operations came out, and he made what I felt was such a disingenuous argument to defend all this woke nonsense in the, in the reading list for the ensigns and the sailors. He said, we need our sailors to be critical thinkers. And I think what he really meant is, we need our sailors to be critical theorists. You, you do not, if you want to be a, a good, effective military. You do not need to read Ibram Kendi. The, even, <laughs> the idea, by the way, that the military is some open, free marketplace of ideas. Where the military what? literally <laughs> brainwashes you. That's like the point of military <laughs> training. Yep. And that, but and now they're doing that in Marcuse, in Mao, in all of the people actually that I talk about in this book. Speechless, right coincidentally. I, I mean, th- that is the 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 infiltration that we've seen in all our institutions. So now it's there. And every moment that they're reading Kendi and Mao is a moment that they're not reading a worthwhile writer. Yes. Sun Tzu. Sun Tzu, yeah. right. Or I mean, some the classics. Right, or Klaus Fitz or somebody, yeah. You know, we had Bannon the other day, and he said, we're winning. We're, we're winning. He's, he said he was against all the, you know, the violence of the Capitol. He was in favor of the commission investigating it, get to the bottom of how it happened, because the violence is bad. He was like, come August 15th, when these kids go back to school, these moms in the suburbs are going to explode when they see what's being taught to these kids and what they're mandating, putting the kids in the corner, make them wear a mask, whatever it is. But I I really do think, imagine what happens when, I mean, first of all, imagine this, you're uh, you got a, your, your kid just turned 18, wants to join the Navy. Yeah. He comes back to visit you after basic training and it's like, so what'd you learn? And he's like, I learned you're an evil oppressor, yeah. white devil. They're going to be like... What? Uh, <laughs> That's yeah. the basic training? But, You're but, supposed to like be hardened and get in shape. People were so shocked when the Navy, when, no, it wasn't even the Navy. There were a lot of jokes to make about the Navy over this. But it, was, <laughs> but it wasn't even the Navy. It was the Army came out with that ad. Yes. And they said, you know, it was that cartoon of the young girl. And she said, I became a strong soldier because my lesbian moms took me to pride parades as a kid. You think, oh, okay, I don't know about that. There, this is not by accident when we can laugh about it and say oh how funny that the cia went woke cia has actually been woke for a long time but the army went woke the purpose of this is to attract leftist people and to repel conservative people to finish that infiltration of the institutions and it it's obviously working 
Uh, that is a very dangerous thing because once that one goes, I, we're out. We're out of the culture, aren't we? Yeah, this is this is the first time I've really thought of this as life and death um, mm. for our species. If if the not that the American military is like the one is like the great protector. There's a lot of we. I have pretty big United one. States bias. Obviously, yeah, I come yeah. from the U.S. I've been taught propaganda. America's U.S. Great. propaganda it maintains the world. It's pretty cool right though, now, yeah. and. If it gets uh, if it gets co-opted, not only did it lose a war, but it's on the side of that which co-opted it. Mm. So it's like double your enemy. It, it is, you know, the the critical theory of it all. I know this is the, these terms get thrown around now, and now the left is retreating into this nominalism of well, what really is critical theory? Right. What really? Is? But the theory is very simple. The theory is to criticize. When, whenever some <laughs> whenever some reporter tries to have a gotcha with what is critical race theory, what is it's very simply it's to to ruthlessly criticize all that exists in the words of Marx. So that that's what they're doing. And the idea that we need deconstruction in the military, we need destruction from the military, but we don't need deconstruction within the military. That's a recipe for national death, which is probably what they want. I mean, physical deconstruction of uh, foreign yeah. military bases yeah, yeah. with use of uh, ordnance. <laughs> Yes. Um, philosophical deconstruction of the system in place, which we use to defend our country. Not so much, but that's what's happening. But, do you know, th this, I think, brings up an important point for conservatives or even people who are just not woke, who are kind of normal. The reason they fail a lot of the time is because they are arguing in fantasy world American government. Hmm. So that when they make arguments about American politics, they're making arguments about the three branches of government and the checks and balances and the separation and the thing that you probably are no longer taught in civics class, but you used to be taught. The left is playing in the political realities. Where, where are our laws made? Are they, uh, I am a bill and I call myself, you know, and you're made <laughs> on Capitol Hill and then you... No, our bills are made by some faceless, nameless bureaucrat in some gray building in Washington, D.C., or even outside of Washington, D.C. Our laws are effectively made by oligarchs in Silicon Valley. As Mitch right. McConnell pointed out the other day, they, they behave like a woke parallel government. The left knows that, so they, they engage in politics in a much more effective way because they go where the power really is, not the fantasy of where, where power used to be 100 years ago. Th this is why I think what, uh, what you guys over the Daily Wire uh, are doing with movies and things is so important, building culture. And that's why I um, want to do the exact same thing, right? So I mentioned we have like this paranormal writer who's joining. We want to write more than just news. Right, doing a show about um, ghosts and Bigfoot. Yeah, It sounds really silly. A lot of people who are uh, much more intelligent or well-versed in politics might be like, how is this going to explain to people what's happening? And it's like, no, 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 it's not. What it's going to do is it's going to get a bunch of regular people who don't understand anything to be like, oh, I love the uh, TimCast.com. They do that Bigfoot show. It's amazing. Oh, cool. Oh, what's he saying about politics? What's he saying about government? Well, you'll also see on the website news stories. Yeah. And then you might click on a news story and say, I didn't realize Russia Gate was fake news yeah. <laughs> because I only ever watch CNN. So we do things that are fun to create a welcoming, inspirational, and fun place. Yeah where you can also get access to information that you maybe won't get in these other places. So like culture building is so important. Breitbart knew it. Yeah. Politics is downstream from culture. The left is fighting in that, in that arena. And when it comes to like this, this, uh, uh, this general, Millie, the things he's saying, what, what do you think? Uh, for, I'll say this. There's, there's, a, there's a phrase, out of sight, out of mind. You ever, you, ever, you ever notice that thing where you'll hear a word for the first time and then all of a sudden you'll hear it everywhere? Or you'll see a car for the first time, yeah. and then also you'll, you'll buy a car, and then also you see you see, yeah. you see it everywhere. Called? Yeah, yeah. I don't I don't know, but it's it's the, the general idea, you know, out of sight, out of mind. When you're thinking of something, you'll start to see it more. If you constantly fight the culture war in the leftist terms, mm -hmm. then what happens is you are arguing: is critical race theory the idea that X, Y, and Z right or wrong? What happens then is you have a lot of people say critical race theory. Huh? I agree with it. I critical race theory. I disagree with it. What if instead of even arguing about critical race theory, you argued gun rights? So no one was even talking about those ideas. Yeah. Those ideas would never spread. Well, the other, the other Republicans and conservatives don't fight on their own battlefield. And, and, you know, probably the most sympathetic historian of critical theory, Martin Jay, who I actually discuss in this book, uh, Speechless, he, uh, Martin Jay made this point that critical theory is not so much... Uh, an academic system as it is a gadfly on other systems. So critical theory is just this analytical lens that kind of infiltrates history and literature and, and just every, now it's infiltrating the hard sciences for goodness sake. It's fire. It, yes, it's just kind of spreading throughout and the destroying. university. But in, you know, on the, on the Breitbart point though, I, I do think there needs to be an addendum or a caveat to it, which is 
what Breitbart said is true, culture influences politics, no right. doubt. But because what he said is a slogan and all slogans are wrong, it also <laughs> needs to be corrected, which is culture is downstream of politics too. Politics influences culture. I think of uh, East Germany. East Germany is atheist today. West Germany is religious today. It ain't because of the bratwurst. It's because of the officially atheist government that dominated right. there for decades and decades. So I just think the left... It, it could be they killed all of those people and all that's right. left, you know, for real, though. Yeah. Yes. And, and, you just and think that's politics. The, the left is really good at making movies and, and coming up with stupid academic theories. Not and, anymore. Well, I suppose that... Well, yes and no. I, I'll get into that in a second. They also engage in the politics. Right. They also dominate on that, too. You, you, you do have a good point, though. On, you know, they're still the ones making the movies, but they are increasingly unwatchable. Did you see the Karen trailer? Oh is this oh my gosh. Is it real? Talk about that. I don't know. It is real. I don't know. Oh <laughs> it is real, yeah. What, it, it's like a movie about this like white neighbor who harasses her black neighbors. <laughs> right. It's bad. Did you see it? I, I, don't, I don't, must I, watch. I can't wait to watch the movie. I saw the, trail. the trailer. Right, but, but, the trailer's amazing. But is it supposed to be like that movie The Room where it's just really bad funny? But yeah. even that was supposed to be good. Tommy Wiseau True. really thought it was good. Well, this he's, is he, it. This is he's nice. now claiming it was meant to be of bad. Yeah, sure. Good. Thank you, Tommy. But it became a cult classic. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, you got, you got to watch out for that. But then you look at things like Ghostbusters. Yeah. There are a lot of movies. No, no, no. You know, you know what takes the cake is The Craft. Have you seen the new The Craft? No. You remember the 90s one? No, I didn't see the old The Craft. The old The Craft <laughs> was the old The Craft was uh, uh who was who was in that movie? I don't remember. But it was like four, four girls and their witches and they fight each other or something. Yeah. Uh it, it, it's it's not bad. I, I'd give it a C plus. It's an old 90s movie. They remade The Craft. And it basically was a nonsensical non-plot with a bunch of woke talking points. Yeah. This... Like, like no, no, no joke. Like, there's a scene where, for no reason, one of the witches just mentions that they're trans. And it has nothing to do with the plot. Nothing, <laughs> it, it, it moves nothing forward. <laughs> it was literally just, they just say it. It was probably a sag after a mandate. It's like, we need one trans character in this movie. Wow. There was a scene where they turn a bully gay with magic. Or oh so, something God. like that. I think that's what they did. Huh. And the whole movie, I'm just like, I don't understand what the movie's about. Yeah. Because and, and I thought about it and I was like, whoa, I remember like what, what we, we talked about this before. That's a good flicks or something. Yes. Pure flicks. Pure pure flicks. flicks. Yes. Pure flicks. Yeah, Where yeah. it's like low quality, like <laughs> you know religious right wing stuff. Yeah. But now it's like something changed where we're starting to see conservatives like The Daily Wire make R R Run, Hide, Fight, yeah, which is actually yeah. a really well made movie. And, and, and then and it's not just like, you know, wholesome. I mean, it's kind of a gritty movie. Yeah. Actually. Yeah. 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 Uh, and then you're starting to see the left make these really awful movies. And I'm wondering if in like 10 years, the left is going to be a bunch of pseudo religious cult <laughs> doctrine <laughs> videos. They, they already are. <laughs> right, 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 right. Are. And then conservatives and the anti woke are going to be making fun adventure movies. There is this problem when you watch the, the Karen trailer. The problem with it, as with all bad art, is when it doesn't ring true, right? The thesis of Karen, according to the trailer, is that. White people, especially white women, are these racists who are, are more likely to mit, commit hate crimes. If you just look at the federal government statistics, there is not an epidemic of whites committing hate crimes. Whites are significantly less likely to commit hate crimes as a portion of their population than black people are. Black people are more likely, relative to their population, to commit a hate crime. What is a hate crime? I mean, I think the term is stupid to begin with because it's, it's the opposite of a love crime, I guess. Oh, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, good point. But, but j just even if you're going to take it on its own terms, it just doesn't ring true. It, I, I, I got to be honest, too. It's like I, I, I don't like the idea of hate crimes, and I don't like the idea that um, – I, I think if someone commits a crime, they committed a crime. Yeah, you know what I mean? Like they, 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 We keep hearing, and even, even some conservatives when it comes to the anti-riot bills, they're like, make the penalty harsher. And I'm like, well, if you enforced the first penalty – yeah. <laughs> you wouldn't need to make it harsher. I don't care if someone's black, white, Asian, Latino, yeah. gay, straight, whatever. If they're violent against somebody, they committed a crime, we stop them. Going after them with harsher penalties due to motives is insane because it requires mind reading. I'm okay yeah. with premeditation rules because, like, if you do plan it, I mean, maybe there's, that's like, an impetus of psychosis there that's a little more dangerous for society. But that's just a, another fact, right? We, you can actually prove if someone planned it. You're not asking about the motivations that went into the plan. You're just saying, here here we go. We know this guy thought it out, and that's different than manslaughter. So. I, I, I got I to point this out because I, I did pull up this CNN article about the Karen trailer. And it's actually getting flack because people are claiming they're just ripping off Get Out. 
No, the difference it. is Get Out was a good movie. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't want to make any... I haven't seen, obviously, Karen yet. The trailer doesn't look very good. But Get Out is a good movie about the fears of assimilation, right? It's the, the fear that when you assimilate into a culture, you lose your soul. So that, and it made fun of white liberals, which I got a kick out of. Specifically, right, we voted for Obama, but they're the, the evil people. <laughs> they're the evil people. Yeah, but it, so it's, it actually, I thought it was a kind of original movie. I got a kick out of it. This, at least from the trailer, I can't judge the movie, just looks like it's, it's falling into the mm-hmm, myth of mm-hmm, the evil mm-hmm. Karen. Michael, I've seen the trailer, and um, you're wrong. <laughs> yeah. This will be the Citizen Kane of our generation. Oh, my God. Did you see the angles? The Citizen Karen. <laughs> Citizen <laughs> Karen. Citizen Karen. Yeah. Citizen Karen. <laughs> Did yeah, you see? Did you did you show the photo of this? Yeah, though? I did. Look at this, Ugh. oh dude, it's so it's so silly. It's really Have you seen um, the hunt? Uh, you yeah. know, I wanted to, but I thought it didn't it get pulled. I thought they they brought it back. They, they ended up publishing. Oh, it. They did publish. I, I thought it was great. It. it was good. I it, loved the idea. The idea was, was well. So, so initially, the hunt, the trailer was liberals kidnapping conservatives and then hunting them. Yeah. And so my initial reaction was like, this is not the time oh, yeah. to be fanning the flames <laughs> of this stuff. Even Donald Trump was against it. Yeah. I, 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 I changed my mind later on when I, when I was like, you know, I shouldn't be against artful depictions and I shouldn't play that game about, you know, criticizing a movie I haven't seen. And then it turns out when I watched the movie, it was actually really good. Yeah, well, because it's, it's, I don't think it's advocating that the liberals go out and kidnap. They're the bad no. guys. They're the yeah. bad guys. Right? They're the, they're, so, so it's actually like you, you've got two different factions in this movie snooty liberal elites who are who are just they hate yeah. these right wing conspiracy theorists so much they want to kill them yeah. and then you have just dumb right wing conspiracy theorists where you're kind of annoyed by them believing stupid things but they're not bad people well, they're is, doofy people this is what's actually giving me hope you know you say that Steve Bannon says we're winning and I, you know I, I'll believe it when I see it I've been t- you know I, I've been burned too many times yeah, folks uh, <laughs> but but the thing that does give me hope when these people of all different colors, parents of all different shapes and sizes all around the country, show up to yell about critical race theory. I I see your point. I think it's a fair one that we shouldn't be arguing with their language, and that's a problem. Sure, and we can try to fix that. But the very fact that these people are showing up, these ordinary Americans, and then snooty elites, radical elites, make fun of them, call them, I don't you might say, deplorable, irredeemable, bitter clinger, or whatever, and you are further alienating the common sense American people from this ruling class that absolutely despises them. That is, in real time, a win for conservatives. Yes, yes. Uh, I think Bannon's point is when these children come back from school on day one and mom says, what did you learn in school? That you're evil. Yeah. (laughs) What? Yeah, come again. (laughs) So uh, I'm interested, though, um, in the same, in the same, I I do want to talk about the Loudon stuff, but we'll get to that in a bit. In in terms of movies like this this Karen one, considering how, like, really over the top the trailer is. I'm wondering if that'll have a similar effect if, if people start seeing movies like this where it display, I mean, this is, this is it. This is culture, right? In the movie The Hunt, the liberal elites are the bad guys. I'm gonna, a spoiler alert for anybody who hasn't seen it. You, you care if I spoil it for you? Spoil it. The woman who's leading the liberals is kidnapping people because they were spreading conspiracy theories about her online and her friends decided to, to help her out. It turns out one of the women who was kidnapped, I think she was like former military, yeah. and it was the wrong name. So what it turns out is this innocent woman was being harassed and they were trying to kill her and she had nothing to do with their politics. And I thought that was a really interesting message based mm-hmm. on what we're seeing in the political landscape. Regular people who don't care, who don't want to be involved are being forced into it and accused of being racist and being yeah. monsters and now are being forced to fight for their lives. Yeah. So when I see something like this Karen movie, a lot of people have already said Karen is a, is a racial slur and you shouldn't say it. I've had people email me like, Tim, don't use that word. Yeah. I mean, and I I'm guess like, it literally is a racial. I, I'll say it, yeah, I, you know, but it is a racial slur. It, it references specifically yeah. like white chicks. Yeah, like Certain white. age, yeah. And a sort be- of ageist. A, a, well, a too. Becky is a young Karen. Yeah. Exactly. A Becky, that's what they've been yeah. saying. That's true. And, and so I, I wonder, though, how many women named Karen yeah. had no, no issues in politics, didn't care, and then all of a sudden started feeling bad. Dude. Because yeah. people were insulting them based on their name. My friend's daughter's name is Isis. <gasps> oh, <laughs> man. She was named before the yeah. action. Oh, man. That's, yeah. that's, that's that well, right. so yeah. there was a there was a meme a of um, there, there, there was a meme of, an, of, a, of a mom. Yeah. And it was like a strict mom meme. I can't remember exactly what it was. And it was a woman like sitting down in a photo that people used in these old school memes with like the sunburst behind it. And it would say like, you know, makes you clean your room and then grounds you or something like that. And the woman in the photo was like, I'm not like that at all. I'm like a nice person. And people are using this image of me to represent something nasty. I have to wonder if Hollywood keeps making movies that insult regular Americans simply because their name is Karen. 
Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm not saying they keep making Karen movies. I'm saying if, if they do things like this that insult and deride people, is this the kind of thing that's going to make someone go, I don't, I don't feel good. Well, I, You're making me feel bad. I reject you. I, I hope that that is the case because it, it really uh, it pains me to hear these stories that you're mentioning of, you know, someone who says, well, I, I, I'm not like that. I'm not one of them. I'm one of the good Karens or whatever. I'm, I'm the good ISIS. Uh, but <laughs> but, but the, you have to come to the realization if you are in any way conservative, and by the way, it's not even on the racial politics if you're just white. If you're black, but you go along with the conservative point of view, you are considered just as bad, if not worse. worse. Same thing if you're, I guess, if it's, you're a it's, traitor. It's the apostates that are yeah. a bigger threat. Yeah, and, and I think what all these people need to recognize is the radical left hates you. You are not, you can't charm your way out of it. You can't reason your way out of it. I know there's been a lot of talk now on the internet about whether or not one should engage in debates. And there were sort of, Crowder got ambushed by some libs or something. And there was, there was all of this debate me coward and all this kind of right. stuff. <laughs> I don't feel any compunction about uh, turning down a debate with someone who hates me. Because what's the, what is the point of that debate? If I, if I feel something productive can come out of that, I'll do it. But I don't feel any reason to Well, there, th th this is really fascinating, especially in terms of the Crowder stuff, because, you know, Ethan Klein is not a, uh, a political individual. Yeah. He was say making comments about Stephen Crowder. I don't know how it started. Um, do, do, do you guys know how it started or what, what, what the issue was? Oh, how? Yeah, what happened? Yeah, so uh, Ethan was saying that you don't need to do any of your own research. You just trust the CDC, whatever they say. You don't even have to do any homework. And his wife is just like, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Right. And I was like, what? What? They're telling they have like and millions and, and of people. And then Crowder responded? Or yeah, what? he had issues with that. He's like, why would you tell people to not do their own homework? That yeah. doesn't make sense. That's actually against the, uh, uh, I think that's, that might be against YouTube's rules. Interesting. Mm. To say not to question anything? It, well, no, it's, it's it, that's, that's. It, um, just to tell people how to think about it. You need to tell uh YouTube's rules are that you can't discourage people from seeking the expert uh, medical opinions. Oh, interesting. So the CDC might, YouTube might be like, that's fine, I guess. Yeah, you can blindly but, follow them, but nobody. Yeah. No, no, but I think, like, YouTube says you can't discourage people from talking to medical experts yeah. for advice. <laughs> and saying you don't have to do anything, just follow the CDC. Those aren't your doctors. Oh, right. So I wonder. I mean, anyway. You should have debated Ethan. Well, so... Yeah. Uh, well, Ethan isn't a political figure. He's right. a drama grifter. Like yeah. his whole thing is like pop I had never heard of him. I had no even the other guy. Yeah. I hadn't hadn't uh, seen. He's really. interesting because right. they're kind of under the radar, but they're hugely popular. They just weren't like ever front and center mainstream. They kind of came up on they quieter. Got huge, they get they get like millions of views yeah, in their bucket. massive massive shows. So so the issue though is this is why I would say you got to be careful about who you do debate. Like we're gonna we're gonna have Vosh back on. Okay. Uh, you're familiar with him. He's like he's a leftist uh, YouTube personality. I've heard of him. I haven't seen his stuff, but I have heard. He's a he's a socialist, or he's. A... I, I believe he's a socialist. Okay. He's, he's he's a lefty uh, gamer, and yeah. then we're also um, planning on having on another uh, uh, a few other leftist personalities, people who actually I think want to engage in the uh, robust challenge of a good debate. Like I think Vosh loved it because he yeah. got a bunch of clips where they said I was dumb, and of course we got clips where they were like he's dumb but i think we had we had a lot it was like four hours yeah but there are some people like the guy who ambushed uh, steven crowder this guy's a con man okay. Th this guy's whole yeah, shtick yeah. is to generate drama and so the issue is steven crowder wants to engage in a legitimate conversation with ethan klein yeah ethan klein being a drama channel yeah just turn the cam camera off runs away and then says here you go here's drama so Crowder walked right into that one. I think Crowder was correct to say, "Hey, Ethan, let's 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 talk." Yeah. And then uh, when he released the full audio, you actually see they were being very nice to each other and they were like talking about family. And then Ethan goes like, "Ha and I got gotcha. you." Ambushes Crowder with a guy who's known for not getting a lot of traffic. Yeah. And for trying as hard as possible to get bigger channels to debate him so he can get views. So Crowder's like, "I have no obligation to give you the time of day. You've been blacklisted by so many other channels. They refuse to talk to you." And, I, and I'll tell you this. Behind the scenes, a bunch of podcast networks have already blacklisted. I'm not, I'm not saying his name on purpose. Yeah. Because he doesn't, this is what he mm. tries to do. He tries to use drama to get attention. Oh, no. He's been blacklisted by a bunch of very big podcasts, even some more mm. lefty ones, because he's viewed as a drama baiter yeah. who tries to get attention by just causing fights and stuff like that. Yeah, but the, you know, the right opens themselves up to these kinds of attacks when they go into the sort of. Uh, the free marketplace of ideas must always prevail, and we must always debate everything with everybody, and we can never cancel or ostracize anybody. And I think 
that's not true. That's never been true. I, 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 not only do I have no obligation to engage with somebody who's just a, a shyster or some kind of jerk, you know, I, there's no re- it's actually counterproductive to do that. No one will learn anything. No honesty will be this, this, this is why I say um, from this point forward, yeah. I think it should be clear to everybody, Ethan Klein should be off limits for any, any uh, legitimate political uh, podcast. Of course, the left will probably engage with him because they're going to be like, hey, it's an opportunity to get views and they like what he did. But for anybody who is moderate, anti-woke or wants to have a legitimate conversation. So this would be like intellectual dark web types as well as any other legitimate news news outlet. You you, you can't do it. Yeah. Not with not with somebody who's willing to poison the political discourse for personal gain. Well, you you think about how dumb most debates are. It's really sad because not that long ago, you go back like 30 years, there were pretty popular debates that would air on TV or certain yeah, areas. Yeah, Burroughs was, was pretty well known. Yeah, or you think Firing Line or those kind of shows. And now they're just really dumb, and it's just like two heads screaming at each other for five minutes on cable TV or something. Right. And I just think I, it's so degrading. There, there's a political rule that I, I learned years ago, and I think I violated it a couple times at my own peril. Never wrestle with a pig. If you wrestle with a pig, you will both get dirty, but the pig will like it. So, <laughs> you, know, yeah, so, will. so you know you know what? I, uh, I would give this advice to Steven uh, and to anybody who finds themselves in one of these situations. If I agreed to do an interview with someone like Ethan and they decided to pull up one of these, you know, con, you know, individuals, as soon as it popped up, I wouldn't laugh. I would say, Ethan, look, I got very little time. I know we agreed to have a conversation. I'm not interested in talking to this guy. Yeah. I mean, no disrespect, but I'm going to res- respectfully say no to this circumstance. And if you want to reschedule, I'm more than happy to have a nice day. Yeah. Click. Yeah, of course. Uh, but I guess, you know, in order to say that, we need to have standards, right? We need to actually say, like, here's what I want to do. Here's the purpose of the debate. Here are the guardrails. Here's what we're going to do. And I just feel like we can't articulate it. It gets back to what we were talking about earlier. Did you say? Yeah, Michael, did you ever debate in high school? Because I did. And I, one of the first things you do when you go into debate is you lay out your definitions. Yeah, Like, that's you right. go into it with the understanding of what the words are and what exactly they mean. Right. If we could do that, that'd be great. But nobody does that anymore. Well, so debate's meaningless. I mean, we can't even in the broader culture right. the words i mean this happens to be the subject of my <laughs> oh, book like treatment but but the word we actually can't agree on even the definition of man or woman so obviously right. we can't agree on on the right. on the the rules of this sort of a debate and the, the problem for it in, in the broader politics is the left getting back to your culture point tim the, the left has a narrative about the country what is america to the left America is an evil, rotten, bigoted place that was founded by white guys to preserve their own property so that they can rape, kill, pillage, and burn. You now have someone on the American Olympic team, or I suppose an alternative to the American Olympic team, saying they want to burn the flag. Should have been removed podium. immediately. Obviously. It it's rejected or removed. So, so incoherent to be on the team and want to destroy the country. But, but the left has that narrative. And I guess my question for the right is, what's your story about him? What's America? conservatives what and I, I actually don't you'll get a hundred different answers but I don't think you have one oh I can answer. tell you what is it North America America uh, the United States of America was an ideological revolution one of the first times in history that human beings realized government was derived from the will of the people and not divine providence that's due to a variety of, of uh, issues pertaining to the separation of the power of the crown in Europe with the thousands of miles to the United States, there were individuals who were more reliant and dependent upon themselves, which they then came to realize through the teachings of people like Locke and their own experiences that the king simply saying by decree, by divine providence, they were in charge made little no- to no sense on how they lived their lives. So it was an ideological revolution of classical liberalism, freedom of the individual, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and an ultimate separation from a, another government, which was a, a, both a physical, political, and ideological revolution. It, what, what America represents to me is one of the most profound and brilliant things ever, because while we have mocked the idea of the failures of modern America's exporting democracy, as if, as if you know, yeah. I love the American dad joke where they're in, uh, they're in, I think, uh, Saudi Arabia, and they're like, or, 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 I can't remember where they were, but they're like, democracy kicked in, and then everything, <laughs> oh, yeah. like, everything <laughs> changes, yeah. and like women are wearing Daisy Dukes, and like <laughs> right. people are cracking beers. Like that's not going to happen. But a lot of our mechanisms and our ideas did actually influence the world, and this idea that the, the government is derived from the will of the people. 
this is, this is the reason, in my opinion, why everybody so desperately wants to come here, because you can have a say, the American dream exists, and it doesn't in so many countries still have landed gentry in control of politics or hereditary monarchy. So America means a lot. Okay, now I'm going to prove my own theory by disagreeing with your history of America. Now, I think, you're, I think the, the account you give is fair enough, and I think a lot of people would agree with it. But I would point out our founding fathers wrote at considerable length about Providence. They thought that the country was brought about in this liberal revolution, some might say, but through Providence. I mean, the very fact that Washington escaped from Brooklyn was an act of God. The very fact that this man survived his horse getting shot out from under him multiple times was seen to be an act of God. And of course, there's a, a deep Christian uh, history to America. The, the pilgrims land at Plymouth Rock, and, and then two Indians walk out of the woods speaking one okay English and one nearly perfect English. These are like the only two guys in the hemisphere that speak English. I, that's I, unbelievable. I, I don't think that's at, that's at odds necessarily. Right. No, I the, agree. The, the idea was that there, certainly they, they were very religious, yep. uh, very Christian, but the king simply just asserted his power to rule. The, the divine right. Right. He has. Yes. And uh, well, we can get into divine right later. But yes, I, I agree with your point. Obviously, they, they leave the king. They don't establish a monarchy in America. But I guess the, the problem for this is, in, in your telling, America begins in 1776. But there are other dates you can choose, as the New York Times told us. I've often dated America to 1620, to the landing of the Mayflower. But you could date America to a dozen years earlier to the landing at Jamestown, where there was a landed gentry. I also don't think that disagrees with, uh, with what I'm saying. Uh, when, was, when, when was Locke? It was, the, it was the late 1600s, right? Sure. So this is 100 years before the Founding Fathers ever decided to fo form the Declaration of Independence. But the American Revolution was over the span of, I think, 20-some-odd years. It wasn't that one day they signed a declaration. It was the culmination of so much. And more importantly, I think you're right. I think it perhaps could have been the Pilgrim's Landing, the Mayflower, Plymouth Rock, all that stuff. It was when people separated themselves from the, from the, literally the continent on which they were being ruled and found their own lives and had to make the rules for themselves. But then is the story one of separation or one of continuity? Because I think the, the libs would tell us that the story of America is that we totally rejected the old world. But I think the conservatives, following the example of Edmund Burke, would tell us, no, actually, unlike the French Revolution, which was a radical revolution, the American Revolution was a conservative revolution because we, we actually kept our rights of Englishmen. I mean, when, when the yeah. Americans rebel, they're rebelling as Englishmen to say, You're, we're not being treated with the, with the respect that Englishmen deserve. So it obviously creates a separation, but there's also this great continuity as well. And it's v very difficult to trace that story. I talked to some friends of mine who are from Texas, say, and to them, America is the Wild West. It's the settling of the West, <laughs> right? Obviously, it's where they are. I come from the Northeast. That's the, that's the American story. You talk to people in the South, that's the American story. So what is it? I mean, it gets to this, this insight by the late, great Roger Scruton, who says it's it's much easier to destroy than it is to build. Indeed. So it's very yeah. easy for, for Hannah and Nicole Jones. It's much harder for conservatives. But I, I do think we need a story. I think we need to say, this is what America stands for. And your telling of it, Tim, is a pretty good one. You know, so I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying that's not a good, I, I think good we, option. We, I think we can just simplify and say, we agree with the idea of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Sure, yeah, but what, yes, I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm just saying, don't we need something practical? Don't we need something tangible? I mean, the left, they point at you and they say, Washington, evil. You, you Ian, evil. You know, you, this country, slavery, and they're pointing to all these tangible things. You say things. the same thing back. We just say, we say, you Washington, evil. good. Oh, You're don't evil. fight the oh, pig. They're, they're, yeah. You're evil. Pig wants You're to get evil. muddy. <laughs> Marx, evil. Uh, that's, that's Frankfurt point. School, evil. Yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. critical theory, evil. And yeah. I, got, I got to be honest, they are. I yeah. mean, <laughs> think about it. Just think, think right. for two seconds that the founding fathers who had a lot of really bad ideas in terms of how they lived culturally. I mean, slavery for one. But they laid the groundwork, the seeds were planted for liberty, which led to really smart and amazing people, Harriet Tubman, Frederick Douglass, and incredible writing that ultimately ended slavery in a bloody battle over this, the, you know, to end this, this, this uh, horrific uh, institution. It's the, the things we have today, civil rights, one of the most respectful countries on the planet in terms of your right to identify however you choose would not exist without the Founding Fathers re recognizing life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But is, the, is that not just the progressive telling? I mean, yes, of course we say, like, it's nice that, you know, th there's no Jim Crow. <laughs> you know, it's nice no, that no, people no. have their rights. You, you can look at certain countries that have, like, still, uh, what India still has a caste system. Yeah. So the, the Founding Fathers probably didn't envision everything as it is today, but the framework they laid out led to arguments 
go to the Supreme Court. We make decisions. The issue is, the reason why I say they are evil, not all of them, but look at that Chrissy Teigen direct message where the guy says, please, I've never said these words before. And she's like, ha, 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 ha. I'm going to do whatever I want. Like evil stuff. You look at uh, that that Kathy Griffin lady cut showing Trump's severed head. Like that's (laughs) insane. Yeah. And then you look at Steven Crowder saying, I'd like to have a reasonable conversation. And then they ambush him, laugh cut things out of context and then say, we win. Yeah. They don't want a political conversation. They don't want things to improve. They just want to watch the world burn. Yes. I, I just, I, I want to be even more depressing about it. I feel like you're not being <laughs> depressing enough. And, and yes. the, the more depressing thing is I, I fear we've all kind of imbibed this progressive history because we say some things have gotten better. So we say, you know, we give credit for the founding fathers for setting us up from that terrible old time to this great new time and the left hates the Founding Fathers because they say they tolerated this bad time in the old past, but now we have this good new time. But but what if it's even worse than that? What if the time we're living in is no better than the time the Founding Fathers lived in? What if we don't have slavery today? R- relatively, do. Well, first of all, we do. Yeah. And we and we buy our iPhones, which are made by slaves. Exactly. And, right? and the left revels in it. And, yes. they won't, and they don't talk about it. But but even some do, some do. I got to respect a lot of activists do. Sure, they, but they all have iPhones. Exactly. <laughs> they, I mean, you have people declaring bankruptcy because they can't pay their medical debt. That's like indentured servitude in sure. a way. And college and, and just yeah, col- and just take the most obvious example. We we kill a million babies a year legally. Like legally in this country right now, we kill a million babies a year. I, I suspect that some future generation is going to come to grips with this moral horror, and they're going to look at us and say, "Huh." Though in that that wonderful new time that we, they were all living in, that that seems perhaps more evil than the old time it replaced. But is it just two steps forward, one step back? Is, is it is it that there really are two steps back? <laughs> no, no, I, I agree. That there's a lot of things that have come about more recently that have been really bad. I mean, the progressives of the of the early 1900s were eugenicists. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and wasn't yeah. wasn't Margaret Sanger? Wasn't she? No, she was a leading yeah. f- founder of Planned Parenthood and right. the leading eugenicist. Right. right. So certainly bad things came about and still exist. Yeah. But it's not like we're we'll never be without conflict. But our our, our current understanding of free speech, for instance, is, yeah. is relatively new. You didn't have free speech back in the day. You had obscenity laws. I'm so glad to hear you say this because this is something that <laughs> the conservatives say. My beloved fellow conservatives that drives me crazy. They say we had freer speech back in the day and now it, we're being censored Mm-mm. like we ha- in some ways we had better speech back in the day but in many ways you are much freer to say what you want to say today than you i mean just, you can say whatever you want on tv remember george carlin he got Seven arrested words you can't say. arrested for his his comedy routine yeah and it was um i think was it brandenburg v ohio that yep. set the, yep. the current standard we understand also i was researching gun rights laws Gun rights were way more restrictive in the 80s. Yeah. And it's and, and now we're getting constitutional carry. It used to be may issue, not shall issue for concealed carry permits, meaning most of the co- states in this country would be like, we're not giving you a concealed carry permit. Bye-bye, you can't do anything about it. Yeah. Now laws have been passed that actually have expanded our rights. I'm like, sounds like we're winning in yeah. this regard. But, but, uh, but I'd, I'd actually like to take, again, the more pessimistic view. I feel like, you know, when we say that we have freer speech now, one, I, I think that's got a bad, bad understanding of, lib- of liberty to it. But also, I liked the obscenity laws. I did. I liked the laws against sedition. I liked the laws against fraud and libel. They're still on the books, right? They're still on the books today. We, we threw a pornographer in federal prison a dozen years ago just for pornography. He didn't, it, he didn't have child porn. He didn't rape someone on his set. He just produced obscene pornography, and that guy rotted for almost four years in prison. The Founding Fathers loved that. Conservatives loved that. The reason is they, uh, obscenity is not legitimate speech. It was their argument. They would say that obscenity is just a form of licentiousness. Liberty in America should not be abused to licentiousness. The Founding Fathers said that self-government only works if you've got virtue and morality and, and religion. And so what, what uh, many people would herald as the wonderful expansion of free speech, frankly, I see it as the, the undermining of free speech. Do you think our discourse is freer and more sophisticated today? Or, 30, well, with 40 big tech, ago. it's it's corrupt, yeah. you know, and broken. Yeah. I want. I, I, we had to do two things, right? I want to make sure we 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 talk about your book. But there was something I was trying to talk about back when we were talking about this general, and I think we had a great conversation. But let's go back. <clears throat> I want to talk about the um, ramifications of a woke military. Yeah. Because the, the the wokeness has spread far and wide to the point where one of our generals is saying, "So what's so wrong about reading Mao and do all doing all these things?" And uh, we make jokes about basic training and and you know soy boys coming out, I guess. 
I don't know if you saw this story, but this one from the Washington Post. Russia says it fired warning shots at a British warship in the Black Sea. The UK says it didn't. I don't necessarily believe the UK. Yeah. Russians also say they were dropping bombs in the path of the, of the British warship because they entered Crimean waters. This freaks me out. See, the, the US, uh, NATO was doing big war games. Russia then counters with their own war games. We see the HMS Trent Royal Navy going through the Bosphorus Strait only a few weeks ago, then the HMS Defender entering Crimean waters, which Russia is claiming its own. So it's occupied waters. Yeah. It doesn't matter who you think it, belong, it belongs to. We are dangerously close to conflict. China came out and said that they will join Russia in a counterattack against the U.S. Now is not the time for our general to come out and say, I am pathetic and weak and have no have no strength of will of my own mind. Well, the problem is that uh, Xi Jinping and Putin, they have YouTube and they saw that woke army ad and they said, duh, the lesbian mothers and the pride, uh, uh, invade today, invade. And, and of course, they, they were inviting the aggression. Do you see Putin praise Joe Biden? He's focused. You got to pay it. You got You got to pay attention. And then I see these 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 Biden voters on Facebook being yeah. like, even Putin's recognizing that Joe Biden's strong. Republicans are so are trying to make like Republicans want Putin to win because they hate Biden so much. But even even Putin recognizes Biden is is not losing his mind. And I'm like, Putin wants to destroy us yeah. and wants us to keep voting for the the, the man who has no lucidity left yeah. so that he can win a war. So obviously you had Trump, Trump's foreign <laughs> policy. Whatever you think of the individual incidents, the genius of it, of course, was you just never knew what this guy was going to do. I mean, he'd call, do you remember? He called Kim Jong-un short and fat. Yep. <laughs> just because, just because he had insulted. I mean, this is a pretty wild guy. He, you know, he, he took out well, the top general he in was Iran. called a dotard. He was called a, do a yes, that's right, a dotard. Yeah, and, dotard. And, and so he goes in and, but, you know, but then he assassinates Iran's top general. He drops bombs in various places, but it totally unpredicted, right? He, then he pulls some troops out. With Biden, Biden just is the avatar of the liberal establishment, right? He is, he's just the same guy, the top brass in the Navy talking about, it's just wh whatever is in the zeitgeist, that's what Biden is. And the, the sad fact is, if you know that you're gonna get a traditional liberal establishment foreign policy, of course you're gonna aggress in the South China Sea if you're Xi Jinping. Do you really think the American people are ready for a war to defend Taiwan? No. No way. Not no to way. get involved. And I, I've been advised. I think, were you going to say Steve? Steve yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah he, he was explicit, like, no, no, we're not. It's Silicon not Valley. It's, it, he's called it Silicon Valley West. You lo <laughs> we, we lose Taiwan. We lose our computer chips. No yeah. more trucks. No more cars. No more computers. <clears throat> you, I, think the, you think the American people are, are seriously concerned at the moment about deterring Putin from further aggression in Crimea? No. no. It's so far away. If it was Cuba, yeah. yeah. Right I don't even know about that. I think they're so concerned about, like, look, a general came out and said he's reading Mao and, yeah. and, <clears throat> and Lenin, and he's having the troops study the, the real history to understand this country. Wow. Yeah, it, it's, you just feel so crestfallen. It's just, it's so, I mean, we were joking about how we need to make it even more depressing, <laughs> but it does, you know, you, I mean, truly, you've got to, on the first step to, to recovery, you need to recognize that you've got a problem. This, this rot runs so, so deep. I don't, I, I do still think there is some hope. I think there's a glimmer of hope because the American people are repulsed by this right. sort of thing, but they're really depressed by it, I think. When you see that Russian military ad, where it shows like this, this super like Chad. this yeah. ripped super Chad shaved head, and he puts the hood on, yeah. and then he's like he's looking down, he's all angry, and then he jumps out of the the plane and parachutes, and then he lands. He's got a bolt action rifle, yeah. and it's dark colors, and it's like you, blah, 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 and then you're like whoa, yeah, that's that's so it, tough that's it. Then you see the other one where it's like going to the parade, yeah. and like to be fair though, that was an army ad, yeah, and the Marine Corps ad. It's still a bit more, you know, it's like yeah. a guy, he's walking down the street in a cyberpunk future, and then an advertisement pops up saying, buy shoes, and it's like, you know, pointing out that people have no purpose, yeah. and then he falls forward through the hologram mm. and lands in the mud and gets up, and he's got a rifle, and they're like, go, 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 and then he's yeah. moving through the woods. That was a bit more on point with war and conflict. Yeah, that, so may, maybe the army is looking for administrators and the Marine Corps is looking for warriors. Uh, <laughs> but but right now, I mean, that's that actually does give me a little hope, right? And I'm sure the Marines are gloating over this. But, you know, even among conservatives right now, 
so-called conservatives, they're going to be people who say, well, you know, I think actually if a, if a transgender person wants to serve in the military, that's perfectly fine. Well, you know, I think women should be in combat positions. And well, I think, and you just think, oh, oh, so you're not serious about this either. I don't think that there is anyone advocating for trans soldiers in Putin's Russia or Xi Jinping. Well, but, but I don't, I don't, I, 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 if somebody wants to uh, go shoot the bad guys, I don't care who they are, what they think they are, what I they don't believe, know, man. identify. If a, if a guy thinks he's a woman and is demanding really crazy medical treatments and it clearly doesn't have his grip on reality, I don't think I want that guy in the military. Call, call me an extremist, but well, it seems like there's a problem. There's some logic to, you know, you want sane, strong people next to you in, in combat. If they fall, then yes. you're, you have no protection and, on the side. And by the way, you know, the reason I don't want women in combat is not because I don't think women are perfectly capable. Obviously, they're not as physically strong as men, which is why they're losing all the weightlifting competitions now, including in the Olympics, to men. But it's because I think it's wrong for society to send its women to go fight. I think it's disordered. I think men and women are different. I think we have different roles. We are complementary. We're not identical. And I don't want to live in a world in which I've got a lovely, graceful woman fighting my wars for me. Well, so, so the issue comes down to... Um I guess, what's the right word? You've got by any means necessary victories and moral victory. Hmm. If you have a country that says we will send wave after wave of our own people, we don't care who they are, how tall they are, if they're a man, if they're a woman, or they're trans, they're gay, they're straight, whatever, we will give them a gun and send them your way. But don't you think, like, the fact is women are just not as strong. I, I, this is not insulting to women. It's just a natural fact. And so if you've got an army of all big, tough dudes who look like Super Chad from the Russian ad, that is going to be a stronger army well, than but, a mixed army with women. But, but that, that's under the uh, assumption that we lose some of our uh, service men by adding service women. You see what I'm saying? But, like, but, if, if we have, let's say we had a million uh, uh, well-trained, well-oiled machine Marines, and, ah, and then we're like, we got this. Hey, we also got 100,000 women. That's just a benefit, in my opinion. Well, I, I mean, but we're also not, we're not Napoleon's army. We're not launching these, you know, million-person land wars. And I suppose that one of the arguments, I'm not saying that women have no role in helping out the military. I just, specifically, I'm talking combat. about combat. Well, you would yes. get, it, oh, historically, you have a few women, like Tomaris was a Scythian queen, and she was a warrior queen and basically stomped out the Persians, more or less. Um, you had, like, Boudica, who was a Celtic queen right. that yeah. fought against the Romans. So you get these. I don't know if they were like bestial monstrosities, monster humans. I don't know. But they were apparently fighter like warriors. Like they would slash and kill. And Yeah. But I think generally what you're talking about is yeah. more of a general. The fact that, I, that one can name them, I think, is kind no, of. I, yeah. I, th I think know, the yeah. idea from the modern military in that regard is how do we add more people to combat roles? It's like, well, women aren't serving. Can we get them to serve? Sure. But it do increases we, do, the number. Do we have a shortage of, of fighters? I don't think so. I mean, we don't, you know, the, first of all, the wars we wage are mostly from, like, office buildings in New Jersey where right. we're fighting with video games to blow up bad guys in, in uh, Syria. But I don't, I, if we had a, a genuine shortage of people who were able to hold a gun and shoot it, then I suppose that's a conversation. I, I, I think it comes down to this for me. Um, we should have a standard. You should have to pass that standard. They shouldn't reduce the standard for anybody. Mm. And so I think that's one of the issues people are concerned about is... Well, I, well of course, yeah. I mean, they, 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 in some circumstances, some uh, departments and like fire departments and police have lowered yeah. standards. In, in, virt in all circumstances, yeah, virtually, yeah. right? I mean, but, but so that's a problem too. But I'd like to take it even further. Let's say that there is a woman, you know, some great ancient queen who's an Amazonian who's, you know, destroys the Persian army. Uh, all well and good. I still think just as a social matter, as a matter of the way that men and women interact with one another, as a matter of chivalry, darn it, the age of chivalry is gone, that of sophisters, economists, and calculators has succeeded it, and the glory of Europe is extinguished forever, to quote the great Edmund Burke. <laughs> I think that's bad. I want the glory back. I want the chivalry back. I want, uh, I want a world in which uh, men and women are not seem to be I identical or indiscernible or at odds with one another. I mean, one of the one of the arguments that is that there will never be a war with, between the sexes because everyone's sleeping with the enemy. I want, you know, I want, them, I want them to be complementary again, and uh, that requires people observing certain limits, both men and women. Yeah, yeah. It's a very yeah. unpopular view, I suppose, but I, I think, think it happens. To I, I I think what ends up happening is people start scraping the bottom of the barrel in their conflicts, and things just get weird. I, I will say I will say one thing. Um, a lot of what we talk about, especially when it comes to like women in combat, and um, you mentioned obscenity laws. Yeah, we wouldn't need laws or policy 
if people had a shared moral framework within yeah. their culture. Or w it w certainly would not be nearly as necessary. Cause, but, but again, the law kind of reflects the culture. Right. And, but the law also influences the culture. Jordan Peterson talked about enforced monogamy. Yes. And immediately these leftists were like, assuming he was saying women should be f like physically forced to be in relationships <laughs> with like nasty men with me yeah yeah, yeah. with you yeah, yeah. But what, what he meant was and correct me if i'm wrong because i think you know lydia might you know you might know this what he meant was just there were societal pressures that you were in a relationship you had an obligation and if you didn't uphold your 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 contract then you were looked down upon hmm. that right is that was that what it, that's was, correct and when jordan peterson made this point i don't know if he realized this at the time but he was tapping into something that's absolutely pivotal you need cultural pressure for the things that you want. You need it against the things that you don't want. That way the government is not required to, for example, censor speech. Sure. They can let other people do it. Oh, you shouldn't have done that. Mom says it to her but, son. But, you know, the, I guess I, I agree with Jordan's point, and I agree with what we're talking about. But this distinction, this neat distinction between politics and culture, I think is a little blurrier. Because when cultures and societies come to certain decisions, let's say they want to pass blue laws and you can't buy booze on Sunday. Let's say they want to ban porn or prostitution or something they come together and they have the social moray and they reflect that in their law and so these earlier ages which had perhaps a more moral and upright or at least virtue conscious people also had much stricter laws about obscenity yes. and, and these sorts of things. but most people didn't need the laws right it's it's an interesting conundrum how that occurs and the, and the laws in part form the people and the people form the laws of course it's very there, very blurry there's a really great meme where it's a guy on his knee opening up a ring for a woman and he says, will you enter into a, co a government contract with me that guarantees you get all of my stuff and you can also leave it at any time? Sounds like yeah. my life. <laughs> that's how <laughs> I think, and, by the way. That's, that's a really important point, though. It used to be that you could not get divorced. Like, yeah. the judges would even the be able, a, a, a judge would be like, you need to go to counseling. Yes. You, and, will, you cannot divorce. And, and you know, now I, I know that it is unthinkable that we should possibly uh, uh, make our divorce laws a little more restrictive. Yeah. But of course we should. The, the societal breakdown that has really ramped up over the past 40, 50 years is a direct result of no-fault divorce. It has ruined people's lives. It has d destroyed society. If, if a, a marriage bond means nothing, which practically, I mean, this right. is your point, and yeah. I'm, not even, I'm not even just blaming the guys or just blaming the girls. It, it's, it's set up in such an unfair way. But if that bond means nothing, then you don't have trust as a society. That is a sacred vow you're making, not just before God, that's pretty important too, but it's also a political matter. You're making it before the public, and you're saying, we will be in this bond. If you can just dissolve that willy-nilly, then your social trust evaporates. So let's talk about your book. <laughs> that's what my book is actually on these sorts of topics. Exactly. Um, the book is Speechless, Controlling Words, oh. Controlling Minds. As I, You may have heard of it before. I think I, I have. Has yeah, anyone someone super, <laughs> super chatted it? Yeah. Did they? Super one or two? Yeah, yeah, yeah a couple of people, I think, uh, super chatted I, I do. I have to thank. I truly need to thank the viewers of this show. You uh, seriously, <laughs> if this book makes the list, if this book, if the New York Times is forced to put this on the list, if, <laughs> which uh, I don't think they would do it willingly, but it, you know, if they were forced, if this book changes the conversation, it is because of the insane viewers of this show <laughs> who have forced you. Well, they're fans of you. <laughs> I know, it's yeah. wonderful. Uh, but I'll, I'll it. say it I a million it. times. It's that, you know, reading, reading the Super Chats was fun. I want people to buy your book. I want people to buy Michael Malice's book, Andy No's book, Ben Shapiro books, James O'Keefe books. I want it so that when you go to Amazon.com and you click book, the top 10 are from anti-establishment, anti-woke, or yeah. just maybe voices you haven't heard of. Yeah. Because for a long period, what, what were the top books? Like uh, uh, White Fragility. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Right. And so what happens is regular people, this, this is part of the information where you're trying to explain to people your ideas mm -hmm. and win hearts and win minds. You know, what was a big one was becoming Michelle Obama, oh. which I thought, I don't know if you've seen the mm -hmm. conspiracy theory. Oh, There's yeah. There's this conspiracy oh, theory of talking about <laughs> transgenderism. And I just thought, oh. if you're trying to tamp down that conspiracy theory, <laughs> don't title your book <laughs> Becoming <laughs> Michelle Obama. Oh. That's not oh. a good idea. I, anyway, you got to ignore the, the <laughs> weird stuff, to be honest. That one's, yeah, I know that one took me it's a pretty, it's so pretty out there. I, know, I, I do not I know a guy who's like, dude, I swear I watch these videos. I'm like, I know stop, that guy too. stop, stop. First of all, yeah. stop watching the videos. Yeah. Yeah. Right, I don't, I don't right. know why you're looking at those videos. I, I want to say, what, 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 I love the cover. Thank I love the art. I don't know who did that. This was hotly debated. We went back and forth because some people, some people believed that to sell the book, 
we needed one of these kind of sticky covers where I'm like winking or something, and you know, it was really like, <laughs> well, whatever. I'm, you know. But I, I just thought, no, I, I actually am making an argument here. I don't ever intend to write a book again. It's simply too much work. I'm gonna, I'm just only writing blank books from now on. That's good. Going yes. back yeah. to my original yes. magnum opus, <laughs> uh, but. I, I do want to make this argument here because I just feel like, I mean, the, kind of the central point of the book is whatever we have done to push back against wokeism has advanced wokeism. Isn't that weird? It's just anything, either we, obviously when you get into it, it advances it, but even when we push back really hard against it, still it advances it. And it's because of, Tim, actually, a lot of what you've been saying tonight, which is we just don't have any standards and we're not willing to articulate them. But it's not, it's not enough to point that out because you actually then have to, articulate what the standard is, and uh, that is not always popular. This is why years ago I began, uh, a lot of people would describe the, the leftists as intersectionalists or feminists, yeah. and I started calling them identitarians, yeah, because is identitarian is typically used by white identitarians. Now, identitarianism just means like identity and government, so it is policy predicated upon your identity. Of course, the white identitarians really loved using it. And I said, that's the exact same thing as the critical race theory stuff. And so I'm going to, as, as someone who doesn't like either, yeah. I'll refer to them all under the same name. I had a conversation with, uh, I had a conversation with a friend who's like a very, pro like a very prominent activist, very, you know, woke. And I just always refer to them as an identitarian. Hmm. It puts them in the same camp as the white nationalists. Hmm. They hate it, but it's true. Do you have to get more, I mean, I, I like this point because I, you know, I, you have described what the, the conservatives keep messing up, which is they keep using the left's own language. It's, you, it's just, just to, uh, before you, don't forget that. I just want to make the sim simplified point. If you have a, a red battlefield and a blue battlefield and you bring everyone onto the red battlefield and say red is the worst choice. It's yeah. the only thing that people are experiencing and the only thing they'll talk about. Yeah. They won't even have an experience of blue. Yeah. You need to bring people to your battlefield and make the left come there to argue with you so that instead of learning about critical race theory, they're learning about classical liberalism or conservative values yeah. and making the left argue against those. Preferably even the more conservative ones. I right. Know, you know, I mean, I, but it raises this identity question because... You're not saying we can't have any kind of identity. Obviously, everybody's got an identity. I got my name. I got my religion. I got my town. I got my state. I got my country. That's an identity. So you're, you're calling out in particular, it would seem, this racial identity, maybe this kind of crazy gender identity. But it does leave this question open for you, which is what we were talking about earlier in the show. Who are we as a country and who am I personally? And I've got an old school Catholic answer for you, my friends. Thank you. I've got, finally, <laughs> here it is, okay? In the Bible, Abraham, uh, Moses, rather, asks God, who are you? What does God say? I am. I am. I am who I am. I am who I am the essence of being. And when you identify in that, it's very easy to know who you are. When you turn away from that, well, what am I? I'm, uh, I'm, I'm black. I'm a, le I'm a black lesbian, uh, le Muslim, uh, ableist, cis, pan, trans, damn, white Van Damn, male. white Catholic. I'm Van Halen. Yeah, like it doesn't, <laughs> and you, and it's really pathetic. It's what little, it's what kids do when they try on different different identities. But <laughs> in order to recover that sense of a national identity, you have to say certain things that are exclusive claims. This is who we are. And if we say this is who we are, it's like a nation with a border. Mm. If we say this is the nation, then it means outside the nation, then that's not the nation. If this identity in America, and you might say it's the classical liberal idea, or it's this, or it's that, or the other thing. But if we say this is what it is, then what we are saying is if you don't go along with that, you are not an American. You are excluded. You are ostracized. You might be outright censored. Are we willing to make that kind of a claim? Yeah, I one, one, one of the challenges that we've been talking about for a while is that in wartime, some of our greatest leaders did horrifying things. Yeah. We talk about Abraham Lincoln, and we're, we're so happy the North won, but the dude uh, suspended habeas corpus. There's the, the, the rumor that he tried to get a Supreme Court justice uh, arrested. Yeah. He did a lot of really bad things. He threatened the press. Were they, were they bad? Uh, threatening the press, I mean, these days, that's, I think you should win the Nobel Peace Prize for that. <laughs> but uh, but it's, it's, it's doing what has to be done to, to win. And if we saw that happening today, if like Donald Trump, you know, when he threatens the press, the media shrieks, shrieks and, and howls. If, uh, uh, if in order to win a war, our civil rights were curtailed, we would be furious mm -hmm. 50 to 100 years on, and it was the right thing to do. 
Sure. And uh, obviously there's a double standard because you've got the, the Obama administration hounding the press and harassing right. them. And they, they obviously face no, no consequences for that. Uh, so, yes, I, we've become much more. But I guess this gets to my point. We've become much more individualistic. We've become much more jealous about our individual, some might say licentious autonomy. Mm. To, and we've totally lost a sense of what brings us together. You know, a republic refers to the things we have in common, right? The public things that we've got, we've got together. So if the left has lost that because they've become insanely individualistic on the social side, basically they want to have sex with whoever they want to have sex with or whatever, right? And if the conservatives have become insanely individualistic on, for a long time, the economic side, but on certain aspects of, of cherished civil liberties, and nobody is paying any attention to what we have to do together, what you have to sacrifice, what you have to suppress, what you have to tamp down in order to have a country together, then obviously the country is going to fizzle and balkanize. Well, th this is why, right, balkanization is, is, yeah. is, is a best way to You're describe about it. the Balkan Peninsula, which is like the, Gr the Greek peninsula north of Greece, where it was like just shattered into like Croatia yeah. and all these different little countries. Yeah, yeah and can, continues to shatter. And I think, <laughs> I, th I think people have mentioned peaceful divorce, but there have been many individuals for years have been calling for, you know, more extremists calling for balkanization of the U.S. Yeah, and, but, and name a peaceful national divorce that has ever taken place in history. You know, it's the, very oh, rare. The Roman very Republic rare. split, the Roman Empire split into the Eastern and Western Empire. Of course, then that caused mat wars for years, right, right. Yeah. hundreds of years. Yeah. Think about what's happening in the U.S. And as you mentioned, conservatives are too individualistic. Yeah. So they're not banding together the way the left is. The left is overly a collectivist. But the scary thing is they have this insane moral ideology. And so then you have the libertarians. Yeah. You know, and, yeah. They're, and they're in their space. So what happens? Well, a bunch of states start saying, Texas, for instance, we're going to do what we want to do. Have a nice day. Yeah. And Joe Biden, when he comes out and speaks, is clearly not talking to uh, Texas or Florida. Yeah. When he was saying earlier in the year, like, oh, we got to we got to double down on masks and we got to we got to put more restrictions in place. Texas and Florida were open. So who was he talking to? Clearly not them. And that's what's going to keep happening. It's not so much that conservatives are necessarily too individualistic. It's just that the tribe of conservatives is made up of a bunch of smaller tribes. It, yes, but they, they have no reason to come together. I mean, uh, there was a, a moment, it was called fusionism. This was the post-World War II or post -World War II conservative movement where Bill Buckley and Frank Meyer and others brought together the libertarians and the traditionalists and the war hawk Dems, you know, and, and later on the neoconservatives to come and, and fight against the Soviet Union. Soviet Union goes away. What exactly is uniting the conservatives with the libertarians? They have completely different accounts of human nature. They usually want rather different things as a matter of policy. Why they, when you consider the other aspects, the neoconservatives and, and others, they all broke apart during 2016. Like, what, what is the woke, coalition? Wokeness. Taxation, maybe? Anti-woke. Yeah, ta well, yeah, and I hope anti-woke is the answer, but I, I fear, Ian, you're right. I think the only thing they ever agree on is cut taxes. That's And I, I, like, I like tax cuts, but... I think anti-woke is a, is a massive component of it, hmm. and it's probably because I'm biased. Cause, I, uh, I hope you're right. Yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. not the most, uh, uh, like, lower the taxes kind of individual. Yeah. Um, I was talking to Bannon the other day. I agree with him. He says raise the taxes on the rich. Yeah. The yeah. one problem I said is giving government money. I don't know if that's the answer to the right. problems. Right. But we just I, need to eat the rich. It's amazing how the politics have really hey, re realigned so. <laughs> here. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it, 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 everyone's always trying to find what the dividing line is. I don't think there's one, but there's there, and there are many. The media lies. Do you believe CNN or yeah. do you disbelieve? Do you think they're lying? Well, I think that is a core component. The matrix or out of the matrix could be yeah. the easy way to describe it. And then I also think woke versus anti-woke is, is a very uh, core aspect of that as well, because you turn on MSNBC and they say, Republicans don't want to teach your children about slavery, which is lies. Insane, right? Absolute I mean, lies. I, yeah. And so do you believe the lies or do you un are, are you seeing reality? And that's why it's funny. That's why they say it's a red but, pill. But hasn't the, I guess... I fear the balkanization has already happened and we're just realizing it. You saw that the Secretary right. of State, Anthony Blinken, is now flying the progress flag at U.S. embassies around the world. This is a new, this thing was invented like five minutes ago, yeah. and it's like the gay flag with some other racial things and transgender or something on it. Well, but that is the new flag of the United States. That is, that is rather, I'll be more specific, that is the flag of the liberal empire. So right. obviously the State Department, the steward of the liberal empire, is going to fly it all around the world. The American flag makes claims about America. The, the pride flag or the, even the BLM flag makes universal claims about everywhere on earth. And when you look at Twitter accounts, when you look at people's homes even, conservatives will fly the American flag. 
libs will fly the pride flag. Right. Those are those are two different flags, ostensibly for the same country, but it's really now two countries kind of living together. And these major corporations will change their avatars to the pride flag unless they're the Saudi Arabian branch. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's true. It's though. amazing. Do they right. not have they, they can't edit their Twitter, I guess, over in Qatar maybe? No, strange. Well, I actually think it might be illegal. No joke. Yeah. Well, so they they literally can't do it. Sure. And and I wonder, I mean there's such a pushback against the kind of craziness of the LGBT, transing the kids, drag queen story hour. But the elites and the elite institutions are all pushing this. I mean, that that is the new national identity. So if you're giving an account of what America is, I, I fear that the pride flag is a matter of our, our actual governing institutions is be, is more representative. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you uh, my issue with, with the, the embassies flying flags other than the United States. Yeah. It, we, we are the United States. That is the country. That is the Constitution. That is the Declaration of Independence. You don't have to like the country. You're free to not like it. But you are in America. You are governed by the American government with a Social Security card and all that stuff. That flag is of, of your country. But the go- American government you know, is flying the pride flag. And that's where you see that they're flying the flag of 12. It's between 8 and 12 percent of the country. It is not the majority yeah. of the left. It is not the majority of moderates. It is absolutely not yeah. <laughs> basically any of the conservatives, very, very few. When you look at, this was several years ago, but the Hidden Tribes uh, study that came out, it was YouGov data. I actually talk about Hidden Tribes in this percent. Oh, nice. 8% of the U.S. identifies as progressive. Yeah, yeah. They're flying the flag of a fringe, fringe minority. Yeah. The American flag represents Mm -hmm. every American citizen. The pride flag, you're allowed to like it. I got no issue, but it certainly does not represent but, but it, the, 92% of the country. No, so of course that's the case, but they want to, through the politics and the culture, to, to transform that. And they, they just got a new Independence Day. They, oh, we, yeah. You know, we're coming up on July 4th, also known as Independence Day, but now we have a new Independence Day. It's actually in the name of the, the bill, the Juneteenth National Independence Day Act. This is a local tradition from Galveston when some random dude showed up and mentioned that Lincoln had freed the slaves years earlier, that slaves actually weren't legally freed until the 13th Amendment, which was ratified months after that. But this random date was contrived almost out of whole cloth by the left to become the new National Independence Day. And the Republicans well, voted for it. Well, I, I, I take issue if, if the idea is to subvert July 4th. Yeah, but I think actually, that was the idea. I, I, I don't take issue with Juneteenth. Uh, I'm, I'm down for it. If, if if we look, we have Labor Day. You know what I mean? Like a, yeah. a holiday commemorating people who work. I guess this is my this is my problem because I see your point. Sure, it's a fine. You know, it's a good thing to free the slaves. So sure. I mean, we, we honor those who shed blood, a lot of blood and yeah. treasure. As John Brown, by what's U- up? Ulysses we, S. Grant said blood and treasure was shed to, 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 you know, to keep you know, them together and to end this. We already have a holiday for that. That is, Memorial Day was set up after the assassination of Lincoln, specifically to honor the dead of the Civil War and all that that war represented. I've noticed with, you mentioned Labor Day, all of our holidays, they have to do with gratitude. All of them. Labor Day, it's the ordinary American worker. Veterans Day, obviously. Memorial Day, Christmas. Even New Year's Day, we sing about old Lang Syne. You know, we'll have a cup of kindness yet. What Ju- about Fourth of July? Fourth of July, obviously, is uh, gratitude to our, our country and our founding fathers and the country they gave us. But Juneteenth, I find it bereft of gratitude. You hear it in the arguments during the debate to ratify Juneteenth. All of these congressmen saying this is about the injustice to never forget the evils of this country. And even Barack Obama, when he started mentioning Juneteenth, and he, he said last year that Juneteenth is not about a victory. Juneteenth is about the ever long march toward progress. I think that's, by the way, why they just picked this random event when some dude showed up in Texas. It's, it's, it's not commemorating anything real. It's just commemorating a middle period in between two other events because it's not about the victory it's to remind you of the evils we've come from and how far we have to go but maybe they just shouldn't frame it that way maybe it should be framed as uh uh uh, it was uh the the, the marshal showed up in galveston where some texans were holding uh slaves long after the emancipation proclamation and these were the last individuals to to finally receive their freedom but they still but it still wasn't uh, properly abolished until the 13th amendment I recognize that. Um, I, I like the idea of more freedom, the better. You know what I mean? Yeah, so my, I just, I'll, I, I'll yeah. tell you. I'll tell you my issue with it is they attach the the red salute to it. Yeah. Now that is a very serious problem. Not just the red salute. So it was the red salute in in black. So it was also the the black nationalist hand. Mm-hmm. And also, as and I couldn't tell this on Twitter, but I think it colors. Yeah, were the yeah, were the, the knuckles gay? I they think had so. Gay no, 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 no. It was uh, um, 
It was red, green, and white, I think. Oh, okay. oh the sort of black Italy, nationalist. Right? Is that what it is? That's Italian. Or Italy. Yeah. Or Italy. <laughs> yeah, you know, the Italians always have a racial middle ground anyway. Yeah, yeah. There you go. <laughs> I, I, I like the idea of, uh, of celebrating, you know, the end of slavery. Yeah, no, we all do. It, it right. desperately needs a, a branding re- makeover already. But wasn't, I mean, but, was, but, but, like but, a new but, name. But look at it this way. Abolition if, Day or something. No, I, I think it's fine. I think it's. I think Juneteenth is fine. The it's the only I, holiday named after a day or a month. It's so weird. It's, it's also it's, there are. Is it June thirteenth, fourteenth, fifteenth, sixteenth? That's very yeah, confusing. Yeah, yeah. Juneteenth. I I, I, I. I. I'm not worried about that. I'm worried about the critical race theorists are. They hate everything. But, so they, as, but they like Juneteenth. No, no, no. As you <laughs> mentioned, it was not a day of celebration or they gratitude. Like it was to right, commemorate yeah. our anger. I'm like, yeah, yeah. I'm not about that. I think it should yeah. be a day to celebrate our victory over no, the, 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 you but, know, the amoral, horrifying institution of slavery. But we, we agree on that. I guess my own, my, this kind of gets back to what we were saying earlier about arguing about what the government should be in theory or what, and, and what it is in practice. I, I agree with you. It, there could be a wonderful day to celebrate the end of slavery, and sort, sort of Memorial Day is that, though we, we don't really think of it that way anymore. Yeah. But <clears throat> the fact is, the people who pushed for Juneteenth and wrote the name of the bill and made the debates for it and are celebrating it and are putting the black fist with the right. either gay or black power colors on the <laughs> knuckles. All of those guys view it and are presenting it as this resent-filled anti-American day of reckoning. And I think, uh, yes, w- yeah, would, I, I think would so. that we could perceive it another way, but I, I just don't and know. And you're, you're, you're right about Memorial Day. There was, a, um, I, 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 I didn't look at the story too much, but uh, someone's mic got cut off. He was like a veteran. Because he mentioned Memorial Day was set up because of the Civil War and had to do with slavery. And then they were like, no, 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 we don't want to have this. He's they, out. Yeah. <laughs> but, it, but it was true. Memorial Day was, yep. was, was, was set up uh, following what you said was the assassination. After the assassination of Lincoln. Yeah. Just, right. I mean, very, very shortly there. So I, I, I do think it's, it's important to um, – man, this is, this, this is tough, right? It's, uh, as I often describe it, grain, how many grains of sand make a heap? It might not be a big deal to many yeah. people. They're like, Juneteenth is a great holiday. It celebrates the end of slavery. And then you mentioned Memorial Day does that. Yeah. And, and those who shed blood to end it. And you know so, what, you know it, it, yeah. well, well, real quick, it's, just, it's not that any one of, one of these arguments, debates, or news stories is the most important. But yeah. when you stack up 10,000 of them, you have now have a dramatic shift in your culture yeah. and ultimately how people live, their freedoms, and this whether is, that things are better or worse. It's death by a thousand cuts, right? right. Or all the sand on it. But because... I, I agree with all the people who are shrugging their shoulders and saying, oh, man, who cares? I don't, you know, it's oh, no, another day off. Frankly, it's not a day off for us, right? It's a day off for some federal right. employees. But okay, <laughs> fine. They, they, they work so hard, don't they? Yeah. Uh, but the, the who cares argument has a simple answer. The left cares. That's why they fought tooth and nail to get this thing through. It, it's the same as the pronouns. Who cares about the pronouns? I wouldn't care about the pronouns except that the left really cares about the pronouns because they know that in these very seemingly <clears throat> trivial things, you carry whole premises. In the case of the pronouns, you carry the premise that human nature has nothing to do with our body and a man can be a woman. In the case of Juneteenth, you carry the premise that the original Independence Day was a fraud, it was, it was wicked, and, we, and, and the country is now in Juneteenth, the country's evil and we need to reckon with it. Did you see there was one jurisdiction that canceled their July 4th parade over COVID? But they're having a they had a Juneteenth celebration. Of course, of course. I mean, the the Fourth of July parade that's unnecessary, and fr- frankly, it's even worse than unnecessary. But Juneteenth, that's our nation's most sacred feast. Let's go to super hey, chats. Hey, I, had a, I had a question real quick. Can I identify as no gender? Yes. Yes. Okay, I'm going to start can. doing it. Yeah, right. and, and you, you you get an X on your ID. Oh, I don't and want an so, X. I don't so, identify as an X. I want nothing. It's You're called nothing. agender. I'm not a gender. I just don't have one. <laughs> that's Isn't what a gender sort of means. I'm not an atheist. I just don't believe necessarily believe in. A means a without. Didn't so Prince do that? Is the word. Didn't yeah. Prince, the musician, he was like he just didn't have a name. That's why yeah. they called him the artist yeah. formerly known. Apparently, as that was like for that like for like legal yeah. reasons, so it's harder to sue him or something. But, <laughs> really? Uh, I don't know. That's what I heard. Anyway, <laughs> let's go to super chats. Okay. If you have not already, smash that like button, subscribe to this channel, share this show, and make sure you go to timcast.com, become a member, support our fierce and independent journalism, and the bonus segment, which will be coming up after the show. All right, John Lee says, Tim, I had some questions. Are you going to put the stream on your website? And where is my chicken stream? It's been a month since I asked. We are rebuilding Chicken City to make it bigger and better and improved. And um, we're doing a lot of work right now. It should be done maybe early next week. And then we've got to set up the computers and everything. So as we get more and more people onto the team, like we're hiring, like I mentioned, the paranormal writer and stuff like that then we can hire faster and faster and faster, but it's a snowball rolling down a hill, so it starts slow. 
chickens are doing their thing. Um, we are going to be building this really awesome. We, we're building this really awesome, like external little cabin tree house to house the, the computers and the servers that will be above or, or and underneath it is the chicken city where we'll have the cameras and the stream. This way we can have a protected area from rain and, and, and bad weather. So the cameras can always be operating and more open space. Uh, there's there's some other logistical reasons why we have to move it to in, in order to make it happen. But you know, they've been so eating the ground, right? They've been basically chickenizing the, the earth underneath them. It's, they can't eat the bugs or the what do you mean grass? Aren't they haven't they like consumed all the grass? And oh, now they definitely. Need to be, so they need to be constantly moved around or have a lot. Well, of space. We, we we need a bigger space for the chicken run. It's an analogy of capitalism. Yeah, it's it is not know. sustainable know, on its own. It's not, we need to import food. We need to bring <laughs> things in. So we, we they need to have their coop, and then they need to have the big open field where they can do you know chicken stuff. Chicken stuff. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> All right, let's see. Tony L says, drop a like for Michael Knowles' Tim Pool Jam Session. Yes. Maybe, wow, maybe. Yeah, man. Super fun. Mark West says, I didn't know Knowles played the guitar. Rock on. Yeah. That's, an, that, that's a Michael Knowles original. You can only hear here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Tim Castile. Some mad finger picking. Maddie Matt Matt says, what the heck, Tim? I thought the jam days were supposed to be on Fridays. I'm speechless. <laughs> wow. Just like Michael man. Knowles' new book, Speechless, Controlling Words, Controlling Minds, which is now on sale. You know, if I had, if I had really thought to get my own plug in, I would have done the jam with no words. Oh, every everybody choice. should buy Michael Knowles' book so that it hits number one, and then everyone who goes to Amazon or whatever, they see it and they go, I wonder what this is, and they look at it and they buy it. And, and then in the New York Times, minutes. they're like, here's a bestseller. That's what needs to happen. It would be so glorious. The one thing I've noticed, I, you know, I've been perusing the charts just uh, obsessively and <laughs> just completely neurotically, and I've been looking. Apparently, the majority of books in the top 100 books on Amazon are children's books and cookbooks. Huh. Interesting. They are. But there are some political books up there. I really, look, I want to beat the left, but I really want to beat Ben Shapiro. I really, <laughs> oh, I, see. I really, he, you know, he's got a book coming out. It's called The Authoritarian Moment. That's going to be my campaign slogan when I run in a few years. Oh, nice. uh, Knowles 2028, The Authoritarian Moment. Yes. And so I really, I, you know, all those things, please. Help me to beat you, please. <laughs> oh <my> please. <laughs> All right, we got one here. Um, uh, Valorant says 1010 10 opening. I was left speechless. Wow. Just oh, like yes. when I read Unmasked by Andy Nelson. Oh, wait a wait. Yeah. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Good book. I heard. Oh, well man, done. you got me. They well got you. Done. Got yeah. me. Um, <laughs> Uh, how many of these do I have to read? <laughs> Rampton says, Older. Michael Knowles plays guitar and sings. I'm speechless. Oh Speak of speechless, speechless, controlling words, controlling minds. Uh, now available for order. I hope I'll sign my audio book. Too much. I, I will sign your audio book. Bring it on over. Oh, man. Wow. Is, um, it, is that just, it's all the super chats. Pretty much. These are yeah. all the, these are super chats I'm it's reading all, through them. That's great. The whole thing is like every single one is I'm speechless. <laughs> I'm speechless. I love it. No, no, I, I genuinely mean it. I mean, one of the most powerful things you can do. Let, let me explain some. Um, uh, I think Joe Rogan's great with all due respect. I think one of the biggest issue, uh, one of the biggest issues for him moving off of iTunes mm -hmm. was that because he was first in best dressed when it comes to podcasts, whenever you'd open iTunes, yeah. the, the, the podcast app, you'd see Joe Rogan by going exclusive to Spotify and getting paid very well for it, mind yeah. you, he, lo he lost that real estate. So I'm sure it had an impact to a certain degree. Yeah. So uh, I bring that up just because being the top trending anything yeah. on an algorithm for one of these big networks means uh, the, the, at the marketing power you get cannot be paid for. Mm -hmm. if, if Speechless becomes number one on Amazon, yeah. that's marketing power that creates, a, it's a snowball rolling down a hill. Yeah. You get to a certain threshold and then people who have not heard about it from this show or any other show start buying it yeah. and then it dominates. But the most important thing is the cultural impact it would have for people to see the top-selling book is a book like Speechless. It would, and to unseat one of these lib books or one or of, you Or Ben know, Shapiro. Or, or more importantly, Ben Shapiro. <laughs> no, I, I would have to agree with your criticism of Joe Rogan only because Joe has not yet invited me on his show. Oh. If he invites me, I will retract my criticism in that way. Yes. Oh, I'm, not, I'm not trying to criticize him. I'm just saying. But uh, I am because he didn't. No, I'm joking. Yeah, they, they, Spotify bought that. Bought it out for him, basically. Right, right, like, right, We're right. going to make sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I you're think, worth giving up that spot yeah. on iTunes. Yeah, but right. it's very, very powerful. powerful and, spot. Uh, but like you say, money can't, money. Money can't yeah. buy that kind of that kind of exposure. I mean, you kind of yeah, but it can buy like jets and stuff, right? And like sh and boats. I guess enough yeah. money yeah. can buy. Well, here's here's exposure. an interesting question, right? So one of the reasons I would not want to give up something like that is because my goal is not just about me making money and buying a house. It's like uh, the way I explain it is. I make money doing this job and the company's doing really well. I don't want to buy a Ferrari. Yeah. I want to buy a good journalism. Yeah, yeah. I'm 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 happy 
when we'll have a, a great expose, you know, that comes out and exposes corruption, I'll be like, yes. Like, it was the work of that journalist, and it was what I was able to help fund and pay for. Yeah. So when I'm sitting on my deathbed and I'm thinking about the things I have, I will have historical moments that have done good things that helped change the world for the better. I don't care about stuff. You know, I forget who it was. It was some dead guy. I'm just going to say Moliere, but I don't know. It could be Shaw. It could be, I have no <laughs> idea who it was. Somebody said that, that hell, the definition of hell is the place where you have nothing to do but amuse yourself. Ooh. And we all know that's true, right? If yeah. you, you know, when, Even when you're in school and you go on vacation, the first two or three days, you're just like loafing around, watching movies, whatever. And then by day four, you're, you're just suicidal. You know, you're yeah. just like, oh, give me something to do again. And that's what you're saying, Tim, is like, you know, tooling around in your Ferrari is great, but eventually you want to do something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I want to, uh, uh, I would have more fun I'll tell you one thing. You know what? Why I really wanted to hire someone to do paranormal and unsolved mysteries is because I was on a road trip. I've been on several road trips. I, I drove from New York to Chicago to North Dakota for the Dakota Access Pipeline stuff. And I love unsolved mystery stories. Yeah. But it's so hard to find a good one. Yeah. And so I'm like pulling up some ghost stories and a lot of them are, no disrespect to some of these shows, I won't call them up by name, Stink. but it's like a guy talking to somebody and it's like a phone call and I'm like, where's the true crime style of like yeah. with music and stuff, but for the paranormal and unexplained and I, I couldn't find it. I Google searched it and I listened to dozens or hundreds trying to find like something that was like the show Unsolved Mysteries was. Yeah. I grew up watching when I was a kid and I was like always freaked out and like the I know. music. All of the, our moms had Lifetime on. I know we're, it's, right. you know it's television for women but they had Unsolved Mysteries. It was a good show. It was great. The, 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 I forgot the guy's name who did the voice but his yeah. voice was just so good yeah. and the music was creepy and I was always like sitting there scared and I'm like <laughs> I want a show like that. So I don't need a Ferrari. I need a show like yeah. that. So I'm like, who do I fund? So we're working on it. That's that's what we have this wow, guy. He's, he's, he's writing long form pieces every week, exploring some a lot of these stories, cults, murders, mysteries, ghosts, Bigfoot, etc. And then we're going to turn it into a, 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 a podcast once a week where it's a combination of mm -hmm. story, sound effects, like a feature, plus discussion and conversation after after that goes on. I love that. I mean, I get, you know, DW is trying to do similar sorts of things, but this is the problem where... You know, I'm about as conservative as it gets. I'm, I'm like knuckle dragging Attila the Hun, and and yet Friday night rolls around, and me and the honey are sitting on the couch watching something, and we're all we're watching these, you know, they're they're entertainment pieces, but they're from a lib perspective yep. on lib platforms. I'm giving my money to some lib billionaire, and I think what. Why can't we do that? Why can't we do something? I don't want it to be political. No, I, not I, but, at but all. I, but I would say that I, I, I think my perspective is going to be a moral framework built on uh, Judeo-Christian values. Yeah. I am yeah. not a, a particularly religious person, but I grew up with America having these values. So I don't think we're not going to make a movie where it's like um, an evil abortion doctor is going around, you know, kidnapping women or anything like crazy like that. No, it'll be like a regular movie, but it'll have tropes about he uh, heroic behavior. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, it'll, it'll probably be Virtue. stories. Right. It'll be stories like that like chaos um, and loss and struggle and, and just, just success and overcoming things about yeah. people in their lives. It's not super political, but there will probably just be that perspective within it. That's not lib perspective. That's not leftist or woke. Yeah. And that's what, you know, I think we need like, you know, so anyway, I think the guy was Robert Stack from uh, Unsolved Mysteries, the narrator. Mm, great. That was the guy. Yeah, Robert Stack. Yeah. Love that guy. All right. What does it say? Blur Star? Uh, Blur Star says, Michael, I am an unaligned Christian leaning toward Catholic or Orthodox. I think the Pope being the shepherd to the church is important, but I have a problem with papal supremacy. What should I do to figure out my internal conflict? Well, uh, you should show up to Mass, I believe. I mean, you know, if, you, if your issue is the the role of the pope and when we say papal supremacy that can mean a very narrow thing of the special role for the pontiff and the vicar of christ or it can mean this ridiculous kind of broad thing where that a, a lot of people misunderstand it to mean that if, if uh, the pope says the two plus two equals five that it, it does and that's just <laughs> that's not what it means the pope has the right to and, and a special privilege to uh, of infallibility when he is discussing uh, matters of faith and morals from ex, ex cathedra Right? So this is a narrow uh, world. He has the right to defend Catholic doctrine. He does not have the right to negate Catholic doctrine. He can't do that. The Pope could come out tomorrow and say all sorts of kooky things, and it, it wouldn't carry any weight. Uh, going back, not just a few hundred years, but going back to the earliest days of the Church, the Bishop of Rome had a special role in in figuring out disputes between the other bishops, between Alexandria and Athens. This comes from Peter. Uh, Peter is the first bishop of Rome. You can trace that unbroken line 
uh, all the way down. Uh, the keys are handed to Peter, and Christ says, uh, Christ says, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And he says, the, the, whose sins you forgive are forgiven, whose sins you retain are retained. I give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. That seems to be a special privilege. And uh, Peter uh, ends his life, or his life is ended for him, crucified upside down in Rome. And, and the obelisk that was looking upon that very cruci uh, crucified Peter is now standing in, in Vatican City. And, and so I think a lot of times you'll hear people make anti-Catholic arguments by going back to the alleged history and they all say there were all these various apostasies and everything. I think the history is on the side of Rome. Right on. <laughs> all right, Mr. Toad says, Michael, I just bought your first book as I eagerly await the arrival of the new one. I don't have time to read it, though, because I drive all day for a living. Is mm. there an audiobook, audiobook version available for reasons to vote for Democrats? There is, in fact. It's, <laughs> there is. You can look up the artist is John Cage. The, uh, the title is 433. This is the official audiobook of reasons to vote for Democrats, and I hope you enjoy it. Is he just turning pages? Yeah, it's this, a beautiful musical composition. <laughs> this uh, this super chat's actually from a while ago. Tyler Toth says, "Fix your shirt collar, Knowles." Shaking my head. Is it popping out? Oh, no. no, no, no. Oh <laughs> you know, I, you know. Look, oh, no. I'm actually I'm glad to hear this because sometimes people worry I'm a little too buttoned up. Okay, there you go. I usually You're loose. keep my. Oh, I'm getting nice. loose, baby. I thought that was intentional. I'm at Tim Pool's yeah, show. Tim that's right. I'm, it's I'm good. Hanging, Pop out man. one collar. Oh, You're not rocking, two, not man. two, man. Sweat I don't want to. Yeah, I might have to pop it back in. I can't take it. All right, let's see. Douglas Kaplan says, Tim, Michael, I pray that your businesses grow. I want the truth, and sometimes the truth is in the middle. I really hope this donation helps out. It certainly does. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's very nice. Thank you. Caleb Greenlee says, hey, Michael, please state why you think a liberal education is important. Also, what do y'all think of joining the military with the outbreak of wokeness in the military? poli -sci major and naval officer applicant. So the purpose of a liberal education is to make sense of your freedom. That's what it, that's what it comes from, the liberal arts. Uh, we are free people because we're human beings. Uh, however, we have lower wills and higher wills and the higher rational will. Uh, the lower will is our appetite. It's the, it's, we want to shoot up the heroin or we want to eat too much fast food or we want right, oh, to see too many women. And then the higher will is the rational will where we, we know we shouldn't do some of those things, but if we don't cultivate virtue and discipline our will and develop those habits, we give in to them anyway. St. Paul writes about this. He says, the things that I want to do, I do not do. The things that I don't want to do, I do. That sounds like a, a, an impossibility, but of course he's referring to these two wills. And this lower will, which is our appetite, uh, hopefully will come into the discipline of the higher will. That's what happens in liberal education. And the higher will is the mediator between the lower will and the divine will. Okay, that's the theory of it. Uh, the way this is practiced is by, by learning these liberal arts. The problem is that it's very difficult to get a liberal education today. At the great schools, what are considered the most prestigious schools, it's almost impossible. Donald Kagan, the great uh, ancient Greek historian, former dean of Yale College, he once commented, that you did not need a liberal education to graduate from Yale. He later commented, you might not be able to get a liberal education if you graduate from Yale. I think there are a handful of schools where you can get it. Hillsdale, Ave Maria, Franciscan of Steubenville, Thomas Aquinas, there are a handful. Uh, but if you don't get it there, I would strongly recommend you do it yourself. You, you uh, engage in the great reading lists. My friend Spencer Clavin has a great podcast on this, Young Heretics, which takes you through the Western canon. It's podcast. really important. I know, you know, conservatives very often, they'll say, just major in STEM. Just major in engineering. That's the only thing. I, I think totally the opposite. If you're going to study anything, study literature, study history, study philosophy, it's not going to get you a job, but it will help you make sense of your freedom, and you can go to trade school after that. Right on. And trade school is probably better for work anyway. It's way better for work, yeah. Ben Walker says, glad to see my favorite austere religious podcaster back on the show. Thank you. It's good to be back. <laughs> it's good to be with you. Oh, yeah, and I want to mention, too, because he asked about joining the military. My opinion on the military as someone who hasn't served is just, I've talked to a lot of people who said that they ended their careers over the wokeness in the military. Mm. Yeah, no, I, I have as well. Very, very sad to see, but I think that's the culmination of the strategy, right? They, yeah. <laughs> the woke people want them to end their, their and military And then Russia fires some warning shots, and China takes Taiwan, and yeah. we go... Well, we shouldn't retaliate against China because of white privilege and colonialism. We kind of started it, actually, and Ty yeah. Taiwan's probably better uh, with them anyway. Yeah. But Russia is a bunch of white dudes. Yeah. <laughs> so we can go to war with them. Oh, but, they, you know, Russia, they're the only white dudes who are allowed to be, or rather, they're the villainous white dudes. Like, you know, in the movies, 
uh, black guys and, and other races can never be the villain. Almost never. The, but there's all, it, so it's a white villain. And the villain is always the Russian. That's yeah. true. Because they're like kind of the weird white. It was people, British you know? for a while. Now it's Russian. Now it's they, Russian. They love yeah. those two. Rad number two says, Tim, if you ever get big enough to start a movie studio, please make a realistic remake of Red Dawn where the bad guys are the woke U.S. military. All I ask in return for this idea is a producer credit. Oh. Uh, that doesn't sound too expensive to produce at all. No, it, you know, so the guy who made the original Red Dawn is actually a friend of mine, John Milius, this legend in Hollywood. Cool. He, he's uh, Lebowski is based on him. He's just this Love maniac. It. You know, he's got guns everywhere. He's a cigar <laughs> chomp, and <laughs> to, you know, he, yeah, he said he you you really, I mean, he's tremendous. And his daughter Amanda Milius is a oh, filmmaker her, yeah. who did yeah wow. she did the, the plot against the president. I would absolutely love to do a movie where there is a rift in. Uh, U.S. armed forces between woke and anti-woke. Yeah. I would not want to make a movie where we villainize one or the other. Right. Where, like, the woke are like, yeah. <laughs> but we actually represent their ideas as they mm. stand and then show this conflict between two factions in the U.S. breaking apart mm. and do an actual... I, I mean, I wonder if it would be, like, there's no real antagonist, or it's it's kind of like well, the Red Dawn is from within, right? It's just it's like our own guys. Like, you know, in, in in most movies, there's a very clear antagonist, protagonist, or or the you 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 know who the good guys, the bad guys are. I think it would be interesting to have you know there are movies that have done this kind of thing where yeah. you have just the perspective of the two factions and the war they engage in without saying either is good or bad. So just, you're you're saying you could have two the uh, conservative and the lib go to watch the movie and they each think the other one is the yeah. antagonist. <laughs> That's pretty yeah, or or actually be like get mad yeah. and be like, that's not how we think. Yeah. And the conservative would say the same thing and the liberal would say the same thing, but it would actually try to be a fair representation mm. of, of the values, not as they see it, as yeah. it is. Right, right. You know what I mean? Yeah, so you might actually end up with the conservative arguing that we have to curtail some civil liberties. It's like wartime, like Abraham Lincoln, like in World War II, with all due respect to the, the Bill of Rights, this is war. And we suspend habeas corpus when it comes to fighting for our lives and our values. And then you have the woke saying the exact same thing in a different way. You know, the founding fathers yeah. were bad. And if we don't use any means necessary to win, we will be wiped out by white supremacists. Well, I think it was John McCain who made this point. You know, John McCain was very anti-torture because he was tortured in Vietnam. Yeah. And uh, But I, for, I, I don't think this is apocryphal. I think I, I'm remembering this clearly. John McCain was asked, well, what if, what if there were a really bad event about to happen? Would you torture someone? He says no. Well, what if it were really, really bad? Would you torture someone? No. What if some guy's about to set off a bomb in downtown L.A. and the only way to get the codes is to torture him? And he finally says, well, I'd get the codes. <laughs> you know, yeah. we would, at a certain point, we're all going to do what has to be done. Yeah. This is a good one. Clef the Misfit says, Tim, for your crossfire thing with Vosh, you need to pit him against Eric July. You said you wanted a libertarian and it will keep Vosh from using racialized arguments as a defense mechanism. Actually, I think Eric July would be fantastic. Not necessarily because I think it would keep Vosh from using racialized arguments. I think he would, and is certainly if that's his position, he should. I just think Eric July actually would be a really great person to have on with with Vosh. So uh, Eric, if you're hearing this, let's uh, let's let's see if you you know maybe we can have. Yeah, what do you think? You think yeah, Eric? I think that's a good idea. In fact, both of the other people that I recommended to argue with Vosh were African American, so mm -hmm. I think that's a great idea. Yeah, I, I'm not trying to do, you know, this This partly came about on Twitter because uh, he, he mentioned that he's spoken with a ton of conservatives and none of them knew what critical race theory was. Yeah. And to be fair, I think my response to him was not, I could have done a better job. The The issue with it, you know, when he asked me to define critical race theory, I, I was like, in layman's terms, I can't give you the academic, de academic yeah. definition. I don't have it pulled up. But what I was trying to convey was, because I, I don't prepare for debates like I'm trying to go to the war with this guy. There are things that people say about critical race theory. Let's try and break down what that means and what our actual complaints are. Authoritarianism, racial identitarianism, these things. And uh, an overt attack on property rights. I mean, one, I forget yeah. the guy who wrote it, but it's in that seminal text on critical race theory. They say that the, the very system of private property in the United States is a white supremacist evil system that needs to be dismantled. That's why people call them communists, is because right. uh, they are. <laughs> but so... Um, you know, I wasn't approaching it like I needed to prove to his side I knew what I was talking about. Yeah. So I'm like, but anyway, this is how it ended up coming about. I was like, I'd love to have you back on the show. We could have another conversation and maybe see where our views have changed or elaborate or developed and things like that. And my issue is, if you want me to say critical race theory is the analysis of where race intersects with policy, sure. 
but that's not what anyone means by critical race theory. Right. right. That's the that's the that's the elevator pitch they give you when when academics ask what it is. It's not fair and it's not true. Yeah, it's important to flesh out the definitions. Like Lydia, you like you were saying earlier, it's the yeah. kind of impetus of debate is that you know the definition of what you're debating. Yeah. How else can you? Or debate? at least you know the other person's idea of what the definition right. is. All right. Let's see what uh, what we got. Evan S says, Michael, did you get my Christmas wreath last year? I didn't get my thank you note. Oh, you did. You know, I actually, I thought I did send you a thank you note, but I'm very sorry if, if that did not go out and I promised to fire however many assistants that I need to for not sending it out. I loved it. You know, I'm, Wow, I'm so glad that you're here. I got this wonderful Christmas wreath now two years in a row with a lovely advent, uh, like a you know, a candle holder. How and it's cool. great. And I put it up right in my living room. And I, and I put the wreath on my on my front door. Advent calendars are the best. Oh, I love it. Oh, yeah. So you're fun. telling me. They, they, so, an ad, you know, it's during Advent in the month of, of December. You Every day, you're supposed to open it up and read some scripture and really meditate on, on the coming of Christ. And then when you're kids, it's really, you just kind of get like a chocolate yeah. every single day. You, yes. you know, they, they have them for adults now, though, which is, it'll have like a little nip in it, you know, some yeah. kind of booze. So you think like, well, you know, you, usually you open them right in the morning. So it's like, I don't know if I need an eye opener as I'm awaiting when the I, coming of. When activity. I was little, we had this cloth calendar where a little yeah. mouse would move from day to day, oh, tracking the days. Mm. And we had the advent calendars. You'd pop open the day and oh, there'd yeah. be scripture and then you get a piece of candy. Yeah. yeah it's oh, fun. man. Those are the days. All right, let's see. Um, Jin says, Michael, I have re received your new book, Speechless, Controlling Words, Controlling Minds Today. I'm on chapter three and very much enjoying it so far. Thank you for your work. Thank you very much. I'm so honored when people read it. You know, especially I've, I've come to this as a best-selling author of nothing, yes. right? So I, the only thing I've ever published is nothing. And then people joke and they say, I read your book. Haha, you know, I read it very quickly. And that's funny. I mean, I made the jokes too. Uh, but I'm, I'm actually really quite uh, happy that people are reading it. And I, I'm glad that you don't hate it. I'm glad that you I'm like actually your reading it. Yeah. All right. We'll do a, we'll try and get as many more as we can in. Jesus uh, Lopez or as Jesus Lopez. Yeah. Did oh, anyone Jesus. know Native Americans kept slaves three years after America declared them Ooh. free? Yeah. Is that true? I did know that. And uh, they also, uh, the uh, civilized tribes, That's I'm not, I'm, I'm not inventing that term. That's actually what they were referred to in parts of the United States. Uh, they held slaves at a similar rate to the local whites. Oh, wow. And a lot, of, a lot of people don't know that the Native Americans who were marched down the Trail of Tears actually shipped slaves in front of them and in some cases marched the slaves in, in wow. front of them as well and they they were not as eager to give up their slaves as uh, other people in the country you're not allowed to uh, tell that story though because it messes up the the victim narrative of of the left that is very interesting interesting yeah. All right, let's see. Actual Justice Warrior says Juneteenth is called Emancipation Day in Texas. Oh, cool. It was called Black Independence Day on the show Blackish. Check Google almost no mentions pre-2017. Yeah, no, it's com it's completely made up. And, and we, I mean, it, it's not made up in the sense it was a local tradition. It was in Texas. As, yeah. as a national fact, it's completely made up. And uh, the, the thing that I find so offensive about it is not that the left contrived this fake holiday to reframe American history. It's that they forced us all to pretend like we'd ever heard of this thing before. Yeah. No, statistically, very few people had ever heard of Juneteenth before like Even three like, years ago. Yeah. 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 I never well, had. the argument from the left is, why didn't we? Why didn't we? But the, the weird thing is, when I, when I went to school and I was growing up, they were like, uh, I see this meme from the left, they're like, why didn't you know about the, the Tulsa massacre of Black Wall Street? And I was like, I did. I, yeah, well, right. That for the, the Tulsa race, I, right, sure, you know. But I, but was, I, even, I even think, in the answer to that question, why had you not heard of Juneteenth? Like, because it did. didn't matter that much is actually my answer. When, when, <laughs> it wasn't when that I, important. Well, this is the interesting thing. I was having a, uh, an argument with someone, and I think it was on Twitter. Or no, maybe it wasn't on Twitter, but oh, no, no, it was on Facebook. And they were like, they don't teach this stuff. And I was like, they taught it where I grew up. Yeah. yeah. And we all knew about this stuff. Yeah. And they're like, well, they didn't teach it to me. And I was like, did you grow up in a wealthy suburb? <laughs> well, yeah. I was like, maybe. It, no, 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 but for real. You grew up in a white suburb yeah. where they probably didn't think it was relevant for you, so you're shocked. Yeah. I grew up in the south side of Chicago where they probably thought it was relevant because of it's Chicago. It's extremely racially diverse. It's segregated, yeah. but it probably was you know, something that people knew about. Of course, I grew up in New York. We learned a lot about the Iroquois. Why? Because the Iroquois were the Indians from New York. Yeah. I didn't learn that much about the Cherokee or the Apache. I bet, I bet people who lived in those areas of the country learned more about them. Of course, our communities actually have yeah. something to do with our education. Yeah. I'm in Northeast Ohio. We talked a lot about the Iroquois, the longhouses yeah. and stuff. Yeah, oh, yeah. Third grade, we used to learn about them. Yeah. They were I've, cannibals, actually. People, that's another thing you're wow, not allowed to say. A lot of those natives were cannibals. Yeah, the Caribs. Actually, the word cannibal comes from the Carib Islanders, who, oh, wow. who were uh, famously cannibals. Columbus discovered them. Uh, Reza Aslan is a, also, is a famous and cannibal. And also, also yeah. notable. Yes, right? they're notable. in. The, you find them in the Iroquois, in the Caribbean, and on CNN. Yeah. <laughs> you, find you will. Well, they canceled this show. So. They did. Um, 
LA says, hey, Tim, are you hiring data analysts at the moment? If so, where do we apply? I'm pretty skilled artist as well. Thanks. Keep up the good work. Hopefully soon, but I don't think right now. Um, maybe in a few months. It just depends on where we, where we go and grow. The newsroom is an investment. There's, there's no guarantee that we make money off of a newsroom. But I want a newsroom. So like I said, I'm not going to buy a Ferrari. I'm going to buy a newsroom. And we're going to have journalists do awesome stuff. But hopefully the articles will be relevant, will be trustworthy. I believe they will because we're going to be hiring a fact check, an editor and a fact checker. So it's like triple checked. The, the journalist does the work. The editor reviews it. And the fact checker goes back through it. And the fact checker won't even be in the same building as these people, as the journalists. And then hopefully that, that value proposition of getting double fact check and good reporting makes people share it, they read it, and then it just it serves as a way to have people find out about the website, and then it helps grow the business. Effect- effectively, marketing. Journalism was always a loss leader. It was prestigious. Yeah. People wanted to know about the news, but then they would get access to the other bits of the newspaper, the advertisements or whatever. So m- journalism was always a way to like, spread the word, to spread the word about what you, the work you're doing and the news. Hopefully this works out. We'll see how it plays out. But I think either way, we are going to be subsidizing good journalism as long as I'm alive and we'll, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll figure out how to make it last beyond that. That's kind of the point. <coughs> oh, hey, this is cool. Someone just said, where did it go? It just jumped away from me. Sam Smith says speeches is number one in politics and propaganda because they can't accept that it is a number one in hearts and minds. Uh, ah. Wow. Thank you. And I'm, I take it as a great honor to be considered the number one propagandist yes. in America. <laughs> I Congratulations, be, sir. Uh, speaking of CNN, yeah, I'm glad is I it, supplanted is it, them. Is, is that actually a category, though, propaganda? I take it that it yeah, is. I mean, you know, on Amazon, there's a million different categories. But, yeah, I'm glad I'm they're, <laughs> they're already calling me a propagandist. All right. Jonathan Duger says, Michael, I had a calling to take Matthew 10:38 literally. I have to make 12, uh, I have to make 12 feet tall by six feet wide and carry it to my church, which is 10 miles away from my house. Any helpful advice would be appreciated. Hmm. Could you pull up the verse? I'm sorry that I, the verse is not jumping to my mind. Matthew 10, 38. Yeah. Do you have it? I, yeah, I can look it up. Hold on. We'll look it up. Oh, while, yeah, while, is... while she pulls it up, I'll read this. Stephen Walker says, get actual justice warrior on the show, Tim. I have oh, heard good okay. things. <laughs> I have heard good things. Yeah. Um, sure. This, you know, this is that proof. They, the Protestants always knock the Catholics because we don't read the Bible. Now, we, do, we read the Bible liturgically. <laughs> we read it as part of Mass. But it means that we can't, like, we don't pull yeah, these up yeah. all of the time. The, uh, one, yes, the, one, specific one. the one verse I can always pull up is Leviticus 17.7. What is it? Ye shall no longer sacrifice your sacrifices to goat demons after whom you whore. Huh. Wow. That's a pretty yeah. solid that verse. That one stuck out to sacrifice me. Sacrifice <laughs> to sacrifice. Matthew 10 might be. Yeah. <laughs> like, well, not sacrifice. The, so, yeah, oh. yeah, sorry, Ian, I've been No, no, we'll go later. The, the verse uh, that he was talking about, which makes sense, um, yeah. Matthew 10, 38 says, whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Oh. So he wants to, like, <laughs> physically build a cross and haul around. Yes, well, it's very, I mean, that's, uh, n- not everything is to be taken quite literally. You know, right. the, the parables, for instance, are not are not literal. But that it is important that people take up their cross. And don't forget, by the way, people always think, well, you got to take up your cross and it's just going to be awful Horrible. and terrible. And br- yeah. But Christ also says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. There's some. This is actually quite a sanctifying process. Maybe you can build the cross out of balsa wood. Oh, yeah. Cool. Well, what is it Jordan Peterson says about picking up the heaviest thing you can find and carrying it? That's the same idea. Yeah, that's true. And the lobsters. And I know, the that's lobsters. That's the other thing that always right. sticks out. Yeah. And the lobsters. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for hanging out. It's been fun. Make sure you smash that like button. Subscribe to this channel. Share with your friends. Give us a good review on iTunes, Spotify, all that stuff. Become a member at TimCast.com because we have a bonus segment coming up. Usually it was around 11 p.m. The other day with Bannon went really long, so it ended up going like later, but I thought it was a really fantastic segment where we talked about a lot about, about all the things YouTube doesn't allow us to talk about. I'll also add one quick point, or actually I'll say follow, follow, follow the show at TimCast IRL on Facebook and Instagram. Help share our videos and like them so that we can attract more people to the website, which will stand independently, and we're trying to leverage these networks. You can follow me personally at TimCast. Someone super chatted saying that I should go to Wakefield Skate Park. Uh, I will do my best to be there on Saturday. Oh, is it nearby? Um, it's like, it's, it's maybe 50, 60 miles. Oh, okay. So it's a drive. But um, what, what, what do we do? Maybe Saturday, uh, maybe Saturday morning we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be there. Man, actually, I don't know if I can do Saturday morning. We'll see. I'll try to get there. We'll see if I'm there. Um, you want to shout out a book, perhaps? Mike? Oh, oh, this old thing? <laughs> Are you? This is... Do you have a new book? You know, I'm glad to be here on the official distribution channel of Speechless Controlling That's Words, right. Controlling Minds. <laughs> Probably more than the Daily Wire, even at this point. That's legally binding. You said it. It is. Oh, no. <laughs> there it goes. All right. This is your book now. I did. I brought it. Thank you so much to everyone who's pre-ordered. Speechless Controlling Words, Controlling Minds. Available. I think there's still some signed first editions, uh, which you can get at speechlessbook.com. You can also get it anywhere books are sold, including in the top propaganda bin 
at Amazon. Ooh. In the, in, the, in the gas station propaganda bin. <laughs> yes, that's that's right. The propaganda bin at the airport, yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, follow me at iancrossland.net and on social media, Ian Crossland. I just want to give a, a special shout out to Michael Knowles' new book, Speechless, Controlling Words, Controlling <laughs> Minds. Oh, did you see that? Yes. Pick up a copy on, uh, on uh, Amazon. Yeah. Anywhere. And anywhere the books anywhere. are sold. Is that, that's is right. That, yes, we've got accurate? the stick. It's perfect. I think that we are, in fact, selling this because I did pull up the Amazon listing. You are the number one bestseller in, quote, propaganda and political political psychology love it <laughs> and Propaganda. i did have a question michael I had a question for you so yes. your first book had no words Correct. so to me is that why your second book is named speechless it's a little cheeky and by the way the first book had no words this book is about words the entire That's book is about words. words yes and so i feel like i've covered the entire spectrum Agreed. and i never have to do it again <laughs> yes awesome. i have well, a I have, I have a book it says like um it's something like the, the uh how the policies of the left will save america and then every page just says they won't. They yeah. won't. I was going to try to sue the guy. You know, I didn't know if because you know, there are, there are other blank books. Yeah, yeah. there's uh, everything men know about women, sex after fifty, the wit and wisdom of the German what Joe people. Biden's there are thinking. a bunch. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. that, should like that. that should be my. Yeah, that should be the next great. one. All right, everybody. We will see you over at timcast.com. Thanks for hanging out. Bye, guys.